Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us in this uh, keynote speech that we've been looking forward to all week. Um, we here have uh, Oscar, Oscar Norelius and Robert Schmitz from White Architecture. Uh, they will give us a keynote speech about um, Sarah Culture Center and their um, practice. And the subject will be timber as a driver for sustainable architecture. Uh, we also have with us Satchu Kavju, uh, which you're uh, very familiar with. Uh, he's, um, he's renowned for his work on sustainability and environmental design and uh, among the key drivers of sustainability in the region. So that's, um, uh, he's going to be mod uh, moderating the speech with me. And I myself is an architect. Also, I have a keen interest in environmental design. Um, uh, and we're both the co-founders of The Circle. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Oscar and Robert. Um, that's okay. And their practice very shortly. Uh, Oscar Norelius and Robert Schmitz are partners at uh, White Architecture in Stockholm, and they are the lead duo behind the 20 story cultural center and hotel in Sweden. And it's said to be one of the tallest wooden buildings in the world at completion in 2021. Uh, White Architecture is one of Scandinavia's leading architecture practices. They work in sustainable architecture, urban design, landscape, architecture and interior design for current and future generations. Uh, Robert Schmidt uh, is part of the strategic office management and director of competitions at White in Stockholm. Um, his previous projects include Tabby City Hall, uh, head offices for SCB Bank in Royal Seaport of Stockholm, mixed use high rise development in Blackwall, Yard in London, the Weave Office Extension in Stockholm CBD, and the invited competition for a timber extension of the Stockholm Science Museum. Oscar Norelius uh, directs the international studio in the Stockholm office and projects include urban development and mixed use schemes in Sweden and Norway uh, and a 16 story hotel in Stockholm, a psychiatric clinic in Paris, the addition to a restoration of the Grand Hotel in uh, South Joe Baden. Sorry about that. <laughs> and the finalist proposal in the C4 TV Inventing Cities competition in Montreal for a mixed use low carbon high rise development. Um, basically, we're going to try and introduce a more interactive lecture experience with Salchuk. And uh, so we have uh, us here to moderate the talk. And then uh, we'll first hear from Oscar and Robert about their, um, about their practice and about their approach and their, the sustainability approach and the circular economy approach and their uh, basically research projects uh, in the practice. Uh, then we will receive the first chunk of questions. So you can ask us questions after that first section. Um, we will uh, direct the questions. Uh, we prefer to get the questions in English, but uh, if you if you can't and you want to ask a question in Turkish, try and keep it short if possible. And we're going to try and uh, translate them. And after that, we're going to hear um, about Sarah Culture Center in Sweden from Oscar and Robert. It is one of the tallest wooden buildings in the world, currently being an erect erected in uh, Sweden. And it's going to be opened in 2021. Uh, it is the building is at the forefront of a global movement towards carbon neutral construction. Uh, they will guide us through the project from the initial vision to construction site and how the lessons learned uh, have in, uh, informed their projects internationally. Um, if you have anything to say, Saj, before we start. Um, bir de Türkçe bir şey söyleyeceğim. E, Türkçe sorabilirsiniz. E, biz İngilizce yaşayacağız. Ne olun olmaz anlamamış olabilirsiniz diye bunu tekrarlıyorum. Çekinmeden soru sorun lütfen. E, biz bir şekilde onları eleyip e, Oscar ve Robert'a ileteceğiz. Merak etmeyin. Oh, well, we're waiting with great expectation. <gülüyor> yes, we're ready to listen. Hi guys. 
uh, so we'll do a presentation. And we're sitting at our office right now. As you can see, there is a plexiglass uh, sheet. <laughs> so we're following all the restrictions that we have in Sweden at the moment. <laughs> uh <-huh>. um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, we're very happy to have been invited to this architecture festival in Istanbul. Obviously, very sorry not to be able to be in Istanbul. But uh, this is one day you will. Yes, we we'll look forward to that. Hopefully next year we'll ask you to come yeah. physically. But it's great. We're very thankful for these opportunities for ex exchanges anyway, um, even though we cannot travel at the moment. So I'm going to try to share my screen. Uh, I hope that this works out. Yes, it works. It's in full screen mode. Yes. Perfect. Um, so you already introduced us, but just to clarify, I'm Oscar and this is Robert. Uh, and we thought since we're in a quite different setting in Istanbul, we're going to explain a little bit why we're working with sustainability in Scandinavia the way we do and in the Nordic countries. And I think that the approach that we have generally in our part of Northern Europe um, is really based on our relationship to nature. Uh, it goes back to a very deep down uh, connection to the roots. Um, we have a very harsh climate here. So we've had great demands on high quality construction for a long time, long before we were talking about sustainability. We really needed to make um, good buildings uh, to protect us from the cold and from the climate. And Sweden and the Scandin Scandinavia has been poor countries for a very long time, up until the last century, basically. So what was actually what we could afford to build, it had to last for a long time. So the notion of quality and closeness to nature is really rooted in our common culture and heritage. And moving on as uh, Scandinavia and Sweden developed, um, this closeness to nature and this uh, uh, care for quality was institutionalized. Um, these images are from the first project that our firm did in 1951. It was a competition for a social housing complex. Um, that was won by four young architects led by Sidney White, hence the name, White Architect there. And um, the design of the kitchen that you can see on the right, there's a woman standing in a kitchen cleaning the dishes, looking at her child in the bathtub, um, was actually based on research on how people were moving in the kitchens at the time to make the optimal kitchen. And this connection to research and this um, endeavor to enhance and improve quality of life has been a core to the practice since 1951 when it started, uh, basically. And today we are an interdisciplinary practice. Uh, we work with architecture at all scales, um, interior design, product design, all the way up to urban design and, and long-term planning. But the people that are employed in our office um, are not only architects. We are architects, we are sustainability experts, experts in cultural heritage, um, landscape architects, we have anthropologists, uh, lots of different disciplines that work together on the architectural commission. So we're not a consultancy that works with different kinds of projects. We only do the architecture part, but when we actually do the architecture, we're not only architects. And we realize that the results of our collaborations create a different kind of uh, projects somehow. Um, we are 750, almost, uh, a bit more, sorry, than 750 today. We have offices in Scandinavia and in London, and we're opening a studio in Germany next year. Um, and we work at these different scales. We, we're based in different parts of the country, but we are all united by a vision and a very ambitious goal that by 2030, all of our architecture is carbon neutral. So this is something that we're working a lot with right now, trying to make this uh, shift towards more sustainable construction. This slide is in Swedish, but um, what, what it means basically is that we don't measure our company and our, our um, business only through economy. Uh, we're also very closely monitoring our own effect uh, on the climate and with emissions, uh, the effect of our projects uh, on the climate as well. And then obviously where we're working, this could be interesting as well. We have four projects in 14 countries at the moment. Uh, 20 projects with a goal to be carbon neutral. And um, we also very closely monitor the gender equality in the business. So our executive management is more than 50% female. 
our board of directors is exactly half as well. This is something that we think is very important when you connect um, sustainability from an ecological point of view with social sustainability and economic sustainability as well, that you need to walk the talk or live like you learn. Another thing that's quite special about White is that we're entirely owned by our employees. So everyone who gets hired at the firm I guess the possibility to buy in and we have no external interests in the business. Uh, this means that we can invest a very large part of our profits into research. Uh, so we can keep going with the same kind of ideals that were um, set at the beginning of the firm. And um, we work with research at different levels. We are funding full-time PhDs uh, at universities. Um, and then we have um, uh, larger research projects, I would say. And then what we do most of is project-based research and practice-based research that is integrated in our projects. So when we find something that we want to um, explore more deeply, we can invest our own means into that uh, and create kind of a partially um, research project that is then implemented in the project as well. And we call this the White Research Lab. And obviously these last years, we have heavily focused on the transition to carbon neutral construction, uh, which we'll get back into later on. Because this is the challenge that I think we face in Sweden. I'm sure it is the same uh, in Turkey. Uh, about 20% of the greenhouse gas emissions from our nation are come from the construction and real estate business. So the business that we are in. And if you add to that the emissions from imported products, it's about twice as much again. So it's a very large part of our effect on the climate. And Sweden today, we, we emit 10 times more gases than the climate can tolerate, uh, or what is sustainable for the climate anyway. So it's, it's a pressing issue, everyone knows that, um, but we have a really big responsibility um, to, to help with this. We also have a very great possibility to improve. Yes, this is what we said, 20% of the emissions. There's also an issue of waste, where 30% of the waste that is produced in Sweden come from the construction industry. And this is almost 9 billion tons. It's such a big number that it's difficult to comprehend, but um, this is kind of the link to circular uh, from sustainable, talking about waste and waste management. So uh, within the research lab, we have uh, produced a few research papers uh, on specific on circularity and transformation, um, on how to um, calculate climate impact in projects uh, in a very hands-on way. Uh, also a guide to climate neutral um, repurposing of buildings and then a methodology for the architect when reusing buildings. Um, because this is one of the issues that we're facing today. There's theory where we've come quite far in understanding what we need to do and how we need to do it. And then there's all these mechanisms that are already in place and we need to manage the transition from where we are today to the future uh, and making sure that the projects that we understand how they function in a circular economy, how can we make them viable or at least partially viable in the economy that we have today as, as we step forward into something else. And just for uh, clarifications, when we talk about circular architecture, it's architecture adapted to circular economy. So it's all based on the concept of circular economy rather than something specific for the architecture. And um, the economy uh, is an economic system based on resource efficiency and creating a cycle for materials. So the idea that there is basically no waste, um, that waste is a resource as well. We need to treat it as such. And from this handbook with methodology for reuse, I think this is a pretty good diagram that we might spend a little time on, um, where you can see the different phases of a building that we need to take in, into consideration. And if we begin with the building that you see at the center, at the top of the ladder, an existing building, uh, that is no longer fit for its purpose. Uh, this is something that we're facing a lot in our projects today. There's basically always a building where the project is going to be executed. Um, we have two different possibilities. Either you can manage to repurpose the building, to transform it and to use it basically as is. And, and, uh, and those kinds of projects uh, that we call transformation, uh, of course, need to be carried out with sustainable solutions um, uh, and uh, environmentally friendly materials and making sure that the use of the building even in the future has a very low impact on the climate. Um, sometimes that's not possible and the building actually needs to be demolished to have, because it's not worth investing all of the resources needed for the building to function 
when it's not fit for any purpose, basically. And then you're climbing down the ladder. You can see that there's a small euro sign and a CO2 sign. So for every step of dismantling a building, you have to, it costs money and it's also uh, emitting carbon dioxide. And at the end, when you've dismantled everything, you've recycled or upcycled what you can reuse, uh, you've incinerated for energy, anything that can be burnt, um, you end up with a large part of the deposit. So those 30% of the national waste, basically. Um, and this is costly and it has a big uh, impact on society. And when you realize that you have those two solutions, when you have an existing building, you can go back to the very beginning of this ladder and say, okay, so when you do a new project, we need to take in consideration these two options that we will have in 50 or 100 years when the building is obsolete. So for every step on the left side, going from a natural resource to raw material, to component, to products that eventually end up being the building, we need to think that this building should stand for as long as possible. It needs to be flexible. It needs to be adaptable to the use it is uh, made for. Um, it also needs to reasonably be repurposed to something else. And in the case, in the 100 years or in the 200 years, when it needs to be dismantled, we need to be able to dismantle it and use the parts for something else so that nothing ends up on the very bottom for deposit. Um, and very shortly, we're gonna focus mainly on new build because the project of Sariculture Center is a new build project. Um, but the difficulty in repurposing is not the theory of it, it is getting it into practice and understanding our processes today in the built in the construction industry and real estate industry are very much built on new production. Every, all of the calculations, all of the economic invent, in, incentives are based on new production and finding a way to integrate repurposing and transformation into those um, processes is key to do this today. And one of the things is obviously that repurposing can be much more economic and efficient than building something new, but it takes a lot more time understanding what you have in place, categorizing uh, whatever is on site today. And for that, we've developed a new tool that's called uh, ReCapture, which uses 3D scanning to uh, basically map an existing building and then creating an inventory for reuse, generating a BIM model, and then we can provide informed counsel and planning on an existing building the same way we would with a new feasibility study. And it goes very fast instead of spending months and months on doing this and actually delaying the process. So this is kind of lowering the thresholds for our clients to start working with reuse in a new way. And if we go back to or focus on new projects, um, the idea of design for disassembly is not new. Um, we uh, are actually sitting in this building right now. The, the, the part on the left which is, um, where there are no lights, that's where Robert and I are sitting. So this is our office building in Stockholm that was finished about 17 years ago. Um, this is a concrete building um, with glass. It's environmental standard gold in Sweden. Um, at the time, we weren't talking about circularity. We weren't uh, really talking about um, waste from construction. Um, but we still designed this building with the uh, lifespan of the different components in mind and saying, okay, starting at the top left, the structure, it needs to stand for the whole building um, lifespan. If the structure is obsolete, then the building will be demolished. So this needs to be robust, it needs to be general, it needs to be flexible um, and, and very long-term. So in categorizing all of the different components in the building from their flexible versus general capacity and their lifespan, uh, we could also select more environmental friendly materials when it comes to the interiors, which are from wood, um, we have an installation floor so we can quickly change the building as well to make sure it's it's viable for a long time. And this is also a very high degree of prefabrication. And prefabrication is a key for um, making dismantling possible. Uh, everything is not glued together by concrete or cement. It's, it's components that are screwed together and that's quite easily dismantled and you can then separate material from each other, which is a key as well. So, and the construction industry in Sweden very heavily relies on prefabrication, whether it's concrete or timber. Basically everything we build is made in a factory and assembled on site. We have high cost for labor, so the transportation and the uh, investments needed for factories um, are more, um, well, generate a, a cheaper construction than, uh, than more intensive, labor intensive work on site. So 
everything is, is prefabricated. And that's something that somewhere we come from when we're moving into timber as well. So we have pretty good um, uh, possibilities for working with circularity now that we know that we can dis disassemble our buildings. But what has happened since we did this building is that we've realized the impact on the climate from building materials, not only energy use. Um, so the office we're in today is very efficient in use. Uh, very little energy is being used. We're also using water from the nearby canal to cool it in summer and to heat it in, in winter. So there's a lot of innovation when it comes to energy in use, but we didn't at the time do any calculations on the embedded carbon in the um, structure. And when we talk carbon neutrality, we've done this little diagram to show how to balance it out or how we calculate it. So on the left side, you have the emissions um, in regards to use in energy. Um, there's also the emissions from the energy on the construction sites and whatever energy and emissions are related to um, creating the building materials and the components for the building. And to get a carbon neutral building, uh, you need to make sure that the right side, the green side, is at least as big. And this is made uh, mainly by renewable production of energy on site to compensate for the energy in use and then carbon sequestration. So the fact that you can store carbon in the actual building materials. And this is obviously the key um, aspect of, of wood here. And then there's also a possibility within this framework to use and invest in renewable energy offsite um, to make sure that the energy that comes into the building is green and that you're actually participating in the creation of green energy offsite as well. And this model is what basically turned us to wood and making sure that we have invested quite a lot uh, of thoughts in developing wood construction because timber is a material that is not only environmentally friendly and has lower emissions, but it's also a material that binds carbon dioxide. I think we can get back to that notion as well later on. Um, yes. And <clears throat> Can I dive in there just before it gets too old sure. to th ask the question? Can you explain to the audience what you mean by trapping carbon? When does the trapping occur? Absolutely. So this this is it's, it's a quite simple and complex concept at the same time. But um, the basis of this is sustainable forestry. So all timber that we use for construction in Sweden is certified FSC or PFSC. And that means that any tree that is harvested to make a building component or to make timber uh, is replaced, it's replanted by at least one or two trees. So the idea is that as a tree grows in the forest, um, it's capturing carbon dioxide, uh, rejecting oxygen, we know this, this is photosynthesis, and um, the carbon is actually stored in the tree. So the tree is absorbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And trees are a little bit like people, uh, they grow the most when they're teenagers. So in the first 20 years of a tree, it is absorbing a lot more carbon dioxide than it does later on in its life. And when you harvest a tree and replant two new ones, you take that tree, you make it into a component, you put it into a building, the carbon that's locked in the tree is now locked in the building. So it's not coming out in the atmosphere. However, you're making space for a new tree to grow in the forest or even two that during the lifespan of the building can capture more carbon uh, outside. So it's not physically the building that's capturing the carbon, but it's the process and the industry as a whole that is making sure that we can capture more carbon in the forests as we take, we make space for new trees when we build in timber. Thank you. That was very useful. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, for me too. <laughs> <laughs> and the uh, engineered timber industry is quite young. Uh, we're talking about cross laminated timber and uh, glue lamp. And uh, glue lamp is, of course, over 100 years old, but the uh, cross laminated timber industry is only about 25 years old. So this is still in its cradle, I would say. Uh, and the industry is booming at the moment. Um, and this is some examples from uh, projects that we have done in uh, cross laminated timber throughout the years. I think this is 10, 15 years as well. Uh, one early project is uh, at a museum, basically. Um, uh, and uh, throughout these years, we have uh, learned uh, the aspects of, uh, of, of timber being carbon neutral, uh, 
as Oscar was telling, and the plenty of uh, resources, especially in Sweden, we have about 70% of our land is uh, forest, and about 70% of that forest is a plant or, or is uh, forestry, which is. Uh, and we also talk about no waste, but also as as the material is lightweight, for example, it's uh, you have better for for. Um, um, what do you call it? Trans transportation, uh, for example. Uh, there is always uh, other aspects uh, of, of the material. Uh, there's psychological effects. Uh, you get a much more quiet and cleaner construction site, which we'll talk more about later. Uh, and it also has thermal qualities and, and helps the uh, um, and helps to uh, to even out humidity uh, throughout the year. And absorbing uh, humidity into the uh, um, to the atmosphere in indoor atmosphere. Um, in Sweden, uh, the, uh, the the public sector or the municipalities are the drivers in uh, in uh, achieving this uh, movement. Uh, for example, here is an example for the a new city hall in the, in a small city. Uh, in Sweden, uh, and these are the drivers and uh, and they are uh, actively trying to create new uh, projects being built in timber. And this was a competition we won in 2017. Uh, and it's a six story uh, office building in CLT and it's being erected at the moment and, and being uh, inaugurated later this year, I, I believe. And, uh, and this is an important factor for, for, the, for the industry uh, that someone is leading the way and, and uh, or the, the, the private uh, sector is now uh, seeing this as an opportunity and starting to uh, adapt to these methods as, methods as well. Um, this is another project that we, have, that we are on uh, building right now. It's, a, it's an office building in, uh, in Uppsala, the third uh, largest city in Sweden. Uh, and this is a private company uh, investing in green uh, in green development, uh, and since uh, the industry is blooming, the uh, the uh, the access to supply uh, is is getting more and more. Since the, the also the industry uh, is having more factories um, being placed out in around Sweden, so there is more there is more uh, actually raw material to to work with as well, which is which is pressing down the prices and make it make it more viable to actually. Uh, building in timber uh, as, as the industry develops. Um, and we have taken this uh, abroad as well. We're working internationally. This is a, you know, a competition that we uh, have done in Montreal, which where we, we, we you both use uh, timber as, one, as a part of a more holistic way of thinking with uh, uh, reuse and also um, uh, the greenery and, and the self-sufficient supply with food, for example, in this, in this project. So this is not only, we're not, we don't, we're not only focusing on timber uh, as, as the sole uh, factor for, for achieve uh, sustainable architecture. This is a part of a bigger picture. And uh, here is a, uh, the head office for Stora Enso, which is a, is a major uh, timber supplier, which and they're making everything from from uh, cellulosa or, or timber, and uh, they want to invest in their new headquarters. Uh, and this is the most prime location in Helsinki Harbor. Uh, and here they also want to think. They have a system which where they have developed, um, but they want to to use uh, to think of the, the timber building as as a viable building that will last for a long time. Um, and, and here we have uh, investigated in how can we how can we work with the timber structures so it can fit different purposes uh, for different times. So this we have co combined this from a, from a, an office and uh, or a hotel, for example. And here you can see in the main courtyard we we wanted to to uh, really impose uh, the uh, the fact that uh, this is this is a. Um, and this uh, new uh, timber industry is high uh, pre precision and uh, uh, uh, high technology based. 
And this is another uh, building that we're building. Uh, this is an office building that we're building in, in Sweden at the moment as well. So you can see that there is a lot of uh, developments going on in, in, for us in Sweden right now. And about uh, over 20% of our of all, all our projects is from uh, is now being um, built in timber. So this is changing quite rapidly our our focus. Uh, since we started to say that we want we want to to do all our projects in timber, uh, so for and for five years we now we have twenty percent of, of uh, our major uh, projects being built in timber and with the with the CLT cross laminated timber. Still, <laughs> this is the tallest timber building that we have in Sweden today. It's not made by us, but it's a church from uh, 1912. So. That's how far we have got. <laughs> but uh, even, even so, this, uh, this church is based in the very northern part of Sweden, in Kiruna. And this church is actually being dissembled and moved to another plot in the, in the city. So that, that's something to, to think about when you're uh, in the life, lifespan of, of the building. Being built in timber made it possible to, to move it uh, quite, quite easily as well. So it's at, at, at the moment they are they have taken it disassembled it and now they're they're transporting it to another place in the city. So that's also that you can uh, so we'll let, live for a long time. And the oldest timber building in Sweden is from and I think that's the world record as well. It's uh, it's from 1120 or something, and it's a, a medieval uh, church or uh, something like that, uh, which is which has lasted for that long. I think this this is basically wow. the set. Sorry. No, I just wanted to say this is very impressive. The fact that they're also moving it now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's that, been done before, amazing. so we're only re trying to repeat and improve. Is aren't we? That's yeah. great. And, and th th this uh, city is actually they have to ch they have to move the entire city or part part of the city because there is a mine there which is expanding, oh. and then so they have. They have investigated and there's a lot of um, timber buildings that they can move to different spots uh, in, new, in new locations but the ones that's from brick and concrete they have to demolish the you know. so it's uh, it's quite interesting to see where which uh, which type of buildings that will survive yes yes that's very interesting information yeah. and actually interesting to see uh, happening so Perhaps I can I can continue to interrupt you. Um, Please. Uh, uh, I mean, I prefer this to be a dialogue, and and I hope others also interrupt from the audience. But um, what I understood, in, in, I'm just thinking about the history of timber in usage in in Sweden, and I, I've been talking about this uh, to a few people as well uh, prior to meeting you guys. I understand that in in Sweden there was a kind of um, collapse of the timber industry due to your membership into the EU initially, where the regulations were uh, fire regulations and uh, the manufacturing, the uh, health and safety regulations were so strict. Yeah. So it's a, uh, I mean, that, that it collapsed the industry. And so now there's this new freedom of regulations, I think, that is causing yeah. this flourishing. Am I right? I, I would say it was earlier. It was, uh, there was a lot of fires during the uh, 19th century, uh, which uh, yeah. uh, they changed the law. So you couldn't you couldn't uh, practically you could you couldn't make a two-story building in timber or that was the limit. You were not allowed basically. You were not allowed to build anymore in a, in a higher. And I think that yeah. was in the earth. so this is uh, and this church for example is two stories, but <laughs> very very big room inside. So so they could go around the uh, the, the legalization. Uh, but technology uh, enabled us to actually get back into timber construction with health and yeah. safety in mind in other yeah. words fire uh, fire regulations and uh, also structural integrity and so on was solved and that's why there is this amazing explosion of potential now yeah. in the last 20 30 years isn't it so we went from in, in 94 then then we when, when we joined the european union uh, we changed the, uh, the the way of thinking of, of uh, the law from saying that you only need two stories into you have to prove that it's uh, uh, you you can get out of the building within X minutes. 
Right. And that's open up for, for new constructions and new things. We don't talk about material. We're talking about the fact that we need to get it. We have enough minutes to be able to ensure yes. that. Yeah. We safe. can go back to that question maybe after Sarah, because this is a really important question. What I would, yeah. we would hope to do is to open people's minds to the fact that this is no longer an issue. We yeah. should get back but, to that later. So, right? Yeah, we can go back to that. But before that, we ever, but since we had so long time when we, we were only looking into materials and heights um, regulation. The, the, the concrete industry has a huge uh, force prompt <laughs> in, uh, and all the laws and the regulations on, um, are made from that industry. Yes. So you have to rethink uh, the, the, the way to measure uh, these things when, yeah. you do, when you do with, uh, to, to, to suit the, the, the timber, I would say. And that's a struggle that we have had uh, throughout the process in, in Sala. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Which well, is, yeah, it's very interesting. It gave, us, it gave us lots of opportunities to work with that as well, with, yeah. to, to work with the exposed, the exposure of the, the, the timber interiorly. And I, I think w what is also good to say in an international setting like this is that the Scandinavian countries are some of the few countries in the world where we don't have a categorical height restric restriction. So it's entirely performance based. So if you can prove that your building performs uh, according to the standards, then you can build it regardless of the height or the numbers of stories. Um, this is not the same in Canada, for example, where you have, or the US where you have tall buildings as well, but there you have actually a categorical limit of 18 stories, for example, and you have very specific paths that you need to follow to the legislation to get there on, on how to do it. And we have, we have more liberty in Sweden and Scandinavia, and that's why some of the tallest timber buildings today are here being developed here. Um, but basically the point of this last slide is, is, is kind of to show that yes, we have a lot of knowledge, we have a lot of understanding on how to develop timber now, but there's also very, very few projects that have been realized at this scale in modern times. So it's, it's, it's, it's really this idea of, of what we know and what we also can do. Uh, and that's why the Sarah Culture Center is such a special project because it is actually using all of this knowledge um, and it is being realized uh, now. So that's why it's been such a changer for the industry here. And we thought that we would uh, show you uh, a little film that was made from, for the, about the project uh, in September. You mean yes. the Sara? Yes. Sarah, before you go on to Sarah, there is a question from the audience, um, yes. which I'd like yeah, to- Yeah, it's a very interesting actually question. Oh. <laughs> Have you translated it already, AJ? I haven't. I can explain. Not perfect translation, but I can roughly. Go ahead. Uh, I'll help you. Um, please, uh, the uh, person who asked the question, if I asked it wrong, correct me, or if you think can, I asked it wrong. Uh, but I also want to hear about this. This uh, I kind of guessed the answer, but uh, you know, the, in the sustainability certifications like LEED and BREAM and. Um, I don't know if which one you BM. generally use, but BM. in the certification, um, the the question is asking that there is very little uh, points given to material choices um, um, in the carbon emission capacity. Uh, wood is has a high capacity of uh, trapping carbon, but um, the, in the certification there is a, the, the, the they're thinking that there is not enough credit given to the selection of material. What are you thinking about? What, would, what do you think about this? And what do you generally think about this, the uh, certification process? The, um, do the certification process yes. really uh, complement the sustainability? Yeah. yeah. The certification will, is mostly based on the energy performance during it, the, the building's lifetime. And in Sweden, we have, we're looking into the effects of the actual building, uh, the building uh, and the middle of material as well. And we, we're going to take that into consideration throughout the certification system, but it's not yet uh, fully uh, approachable. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that certifications have been a great help uh, in order to, to, to bring clients and developers on board. And an awareness making, of- yeah, uh, To making more sustainable, uh, projects uh, before even when when uh, with the energy efficiency for example and making sure that you can actually package this and sell it yeah. to the people who rent the space afterwards uh, 
there are certifications being developed now that are looking more into carbon dioxide equivalents rather than kilowatt hours, where mm -hmm. you can actually, uh, it's also broadening the scope for the energy efficiency, right? It's, it's also looking at the source of the energy, et cetera. It's more, so I think they're developing constantly as well, make, making a more holistic image of the project, mm -hmm. um, getting like an, an idea of how the building is to be used as well. And now more and more looking into the uh, material uh, emissions from materials within the building. We, we felt we needed to, uh, to go ahead of that. So we've made our own kind of format for calculating emissions from the materials in the building um, to be able to quantify it and talk about it. But it's very welcome that we now have official systems coming along as well. We have a, a Swedish system that's called uh, Zero Carbon Framework um, that has just this autumn been- yeah. It's Norwegian from the beginning. Yeah, yeah, but we're using it in Sweden as yeah. well. Um, so as, as, uh, as the question was, yes, uh, the, the, the most used systems today don't incorporate materials. So that's not where we get kind of the pool to use the materials. We need to argue about it in a different way. Um, mm. But I think we're getting there very fast. Yeah. Um, Thank you. But there, there, there's also, uh, if you like, we can continue on to the movie or... Uh, yeah. How do you feel? Yeah. Ija, what do you think? Do you think we go on to the movie or are there? Are there are, if there are any more questions uh, about uh, their might architects practice approach, about their approach to their sustainability, you're welcome to ask now, or we can you can ask at the end. I do have a lot of questions, but what do you guys think? Should we save it to the end or? I would do it now. I mean, I think the, the whole idea is that we compartmentalize to this first bit. The yeah, let's do it now. Yeah, exactly. Then we can talk about timber because I think it's going to um, move on to timber, timber construction. So I'll let the aynı şeyi söyleyelim. Yani sizler de bu sunumun bu bölümüne kadar sormak istediğiniz şeyleri şimdi sorun. Ondan sonra Sara Center başlayacak. Evet. Devam et Ececim. Uh, my, for example, my question is, I'm uh, I very interested your research approach in your practice. I did go through your, I mean, I tried to look into your research projects and I looked at your, uh, some of your papers you submitted uh, on your website, uh, how uh, you were doing a lot of en energy analysis on your projects, uh, both outdoor and indoor. And I found that very interesting because generally it's very difficult to uh, invest that time that research time in a project when I'm sure even in Sweden, there are um, uh, excited clients that want things to be finished as soon as possible. So uh, how do you incorporate research in your projects? Like, do you uh, do you do it before starting the project or do you pick I'm projects usually, and say, uh, let's continue doing this research because I mean, we didn't have enough time, but and also do you have a department that is dedicated to this research part. Yeah, so, so I, I think we, we work in a quite agile manner. So we do all of the things that you mentioned <laughs> at the same time. Um, but what we're really trying to focus on is the practice-based research, like you say. So the one that's integrated in the projects. And what we want is for this, these research projects that are obviously smaller in scale. Um, it, it goes rather fast, but you just need to kind of Put the time in to look at the issue from a different perspective. Um, we, we try to engage our clients as well to get co-funding so that we do it together. Then we have a much larger possibility of seeing these uh, the outcome of these projects realized. And that's kind of the, the goal. It's not only to develop theory, but it's to develop something new, implement it in the project. And obviously, once you've tried it in real life, you've learned much more than when yeah. you just thought about how it could be. So we try to do it within the project. And then, of course, these uh, the, the themes go from project to project, right? So when, when you manage to do one research project somewhere, um, you learn something and then maybe you do the next step in the next project. And quite often our, our clients tag along because many developers now have a very big sustainability ambition as well. So they kind of, yeah, let's let's push this again. Let's find a new project to work together on this. Uh, but also we can use the, the projects that we have just finished together with the client to see, to evaluate them, to see what, what went right and what went wrong so we can learn from the next project to come. And, and, and, use, and, and also when we, when we didn't do as sustainable as possible, we can say that if we have done this, then we could have much easier process to do, to achieve the things that we want to in, in, in, in an efficient way. I see, so almost like reflecting on yourself uh, 
after yeah. finishing. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but also in the beginning, we used a lot of, lot, lot of, uh, in, for example, competitions, architectural competitions to investigate in, in, in different fields that we wanted to, and use, especially using the, the, uh, the research and uh, in, implement them into the, uh, the, the competitions, I would say. Yeah, I have a question which relates to that. Uh, I mean, uh, you don't have to answer this right now because you may have to think about it, but um, what proportion as a percentage of your annual budget do you spend on what we call research? As opposed to competitions, which are, I, I regard them as marketing in a way. They're like how we get yeah. work. Yeah, yeah. Separate that and tell us, if you need to think about it, please do. Uh, but what is the percentage of your actual annual uh, outlay, apart from your staff, your offices, etc.? There must be a number, which is a percentage. I don't need to know the number. Uh, this, <laughs> the, this is the main point, I think. It's, yeah. it's, not, um, it's, it's, about, it's about 10% of our profit. 10 we, we, we reinvest into, into practice-based research. So there is a kind of circularity that you get your profit is taken into yeah. practice and then that goes into research yeah. funds. Mm -hmm. yeah. and that's the answer i was hoping for yeah. yeah and we do it in different ways uh we do it directly within the uh, the office uh we do it also through uh, we have different external, channels yeah exactly external channels so i think yeah. i think it said in one of the earlier slides that in 2019 we invested uh, about three million euros uh in of our own means into research uh, the year before was a little bit more, three and a half, wow. I think, up to four. Wow. So it's it's, and I mean, we have we have a large turnover. Uh, yeah, at the well, you're a big practice. That's why I didn't want to know the numbers. It will depress me. But um, uh, you know, as a percentage of your profit, that's a yeah. sensible benchmark, mm -hmm. and I think that's mm -hmm. a good approach. But yeah. th this also works as an attraction for the employees because they want to work here because they could they could have these th th these. Um, uh, of course. Yeah, the, the facility, the ability. Yeah, exactly. to um, it's like a continuing school you know, being. It's, in yeah, it's basically, yeah, mm -hmm. and um, and that goes a bit to your question, Esha, as well about uh, research department. We have uh, uh, directors uh, of, of research, mm -hmm. but the idea is that all employees are uh, can initiate uh, research lab projects. Uh, you kind of uh, formulate your the project you want to research, and then you can conduct it. So this is something that we're all doing in a network. Um, so everyone can have one or two research projects ongoing, or uh, you take one every two years, depending on on, on your project, interests. Yeah. yeah. And another question will follow. So are you, uh, for example, are those employees doing this simultaneously while still um, um, yeah. working on projects? That okay. Yeah. So it is uh, people's own. Um, um, passion and um, yeah, they have to be motivated. Interest, yeah. Yes. Uh, but yeah. they're they're doing it during office time, I presume. The work yes. that yes. they're doing. Yeah. Yes. That's yeah. Yeah. They get paid for it or it's part funded of the, by the office. Uh, yes. it? Yeah. It's funded by yeah. the office. Yeah. We've, okay. we've, we're funding the the, uh, the hours that they put into yes. it. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. I have another question actually. Uh, sorry. It's, Sanj, go ahead. Well, you were gonna uh, there is a question from the audience. I always want yes. to give them the first. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I actually was gonna translate that uh, question. Um, Baran Akkurt uh, is asking. Baran Akkurt is asking, um, is local are local materials more sustainable or is wood more sustainable? So uh, basically, would you prefer to use wood if there is a more locally um, um, supplied material uh, yeah. available, yeah. I, usually in Sweden, it's it's of course since we we have so in much Sweden, timber yeah. uh, and it's uh, environmentally friendly sourced and, and locally produced. Uh, I mean that's not that's not a good, <laughs> but it's yeah. a. It's a very interesting question if you go to other other locations yeah. because you can say okay um does it because and this is an issue that is, is a very interesting question because we get asked this a lot working and, and kind of saying that timber is a good good thing okay but then it has to be locally available what about transportation etc but um we were also discussing that timber is very lightweight um we do have ways of transporting materials today that have zero emissions basically and i think that that's something that's being developed as well and um, we somehow get a, a harsher treatment because we're talking about sustainability with wood. Um, I mean, the emissions from producing concrete as kind of the main uh, other choice for a structure than timber 
uh, are much larger than producing timber and transporting it, basically. Then there's another issue of locally pr local production. That's when circularity comes in. It's about the economy. How do you make sure that you can have industries locally? Uh, there's heritage and kind yeah. of uh, culture of building. So it's a very complicated question. But uh, I think that we will see more and more timber uh, being shipped around the world as well. Um, as it already is, yeah. for example, to South, South America and to Australia. And, uh, mm. But I mean... Yes, but that, it, absolutely. And, but but it, it also probably... Oh, sorry. I mean, I think that, that I think that um, localization is important, whatever you say, you know, full stop. <laughs> um, yeah. But if, if I'm, let's say I'm deliver, if I have a, a situation in which there's absolutely no way that there's any timber, you know, let's say in Iceland, uh, mm. in the topmost corner of Iceland, etc. I think the question is like that, you know, is it, is it more sensible to take, as it were, you know, stones out of the ground in Iceland or whatever the earth that's available there as opposed yeah. to take. But I mean, I would say if, uh, if, I, if I do timber from Sweden, we can grow it back. We, we, we can't grow back the, the, the stones or sand that you're taking from these, the beaches yeah. in source in, uh, outside of uh, England, for example. You sh you so ultimately, really it's down to, down to uh, the fact of transportation. That's really the main, yeah. the main yeah. thing that you have to weigh in your mind is uh, mm -hmm. how much does transportation affect. The other way to answer the question, I think, is that we're not just looking at the lifetime of the construction process or the 50, 60 years of the building's initial use time. We're looking at the whole thing, yeah. it, whole lifetime, which could be hundreds of years. It, it should be. Mm -hmm potentially hundreds of years. And that's when the sustainability equation yeah. begins to make even more sense because you see and that we, cost is tiny when you compare it to that. We're doing a, a hospital in Greenland at the moment, uh, which we were made in the entire building will be in, in timber. And it's, it's we suited it to be able to transport as light uh, as possible and to get as much material into the, because uh, they don't have any trees at all. So, or another material. You should think about it. Yeah. And there are some more questions, Ajay. Should we ask the next one? It yes. Is, is actually yes. in English, this question. It is. Can you read it? Should I read it? You go ahead. Okay. There is an image of a torn down concrete building in one of the slides. This image is very familiar, especially with the ongoing process of urban transformation in Turkey. Is there any ongoing work about how concrete from torn down buildings can be reused, maybe together with timber structures? So, uh, yeah, I think in parallel, um, we're mainly focusing on timber because we're involved in, in great timber buildings, in, in large timber buildings, but uh, there's a lot of development being done within other industries as well. So. Uh, you could say that timber development is good in one way because it has a minimal impact. It's also good because it's it's inducing change in both concrete and steel industries as well, uh, using greener energy and and different um, uh, compositions of the material as well. Um, I mean, I think we're familiar with basically the same processes that that you are with reusing torn down concrete. Is that you mash it up and then you mix it into new concrete, for example. Um, but the only way that you can use demolished concrete today is uh, as a filler somehow. Uh, it's if, if you don't need the material, you can put anything in and then you can put reclaimed bricks in or you could put um, uh, demolished concrete. Um, so I, I don't think it's it's gone much further than that. I mean, that's gonna be a big, big changer as well if you don't have to, if you can reduce the amount of concrete uh, by 30, 40% by using old, that's very good as well. Yeah. Um, but that's basically the way that you can use these um, demolished that, that are made into kind of smaller pieces. There's also research being done on, on how how much um, the, the actual limestone uh, within or like the um, with the, the concrete is actually binding carbon dioxide back as well. Uh, and that's something that the concrete industry talks a lot about so that when you break concrete and you expose a lot a large part of surface, it's actually reversing the uh, process of calcination. Um, so it's binding back carbon dioxide, but What's important to mention, I think, is that, I mean, this is good, but it's at a much, much, much slower rate than the trees do in the forests. It's, you, it's basically, uh, you can almost not measure it if you put it on the same scale. Yeah. It's a fraction. Yeah. Well, I think we should go on to your next stage because we've now uh, done nearly an hour. So what do you think, Ajay? Uh, yeah, it's or, very uh, limited in time. Yeah, uh, another hour. definitely move. So I would go for your movie and, mm -hmm. um, 
and then uh, go on to Sarah. And then at the end, we'll have time, time for more questions, hopefully. Uh, so uh, now Oscar and Robert will share a video on screen. If your internet is a bit slow, uh, you might not be able to see the movie uh, video. Great, but uh, we're going to share the link to the video. Uh, o linke tıklayıp linkten videoyu izleyebilirsiniz Türkçe'de tekrar diyeyim. Ee, belki internet bağlantınızdan dolayı zorlanabilirsiniz e, ekran paylaşımında. We're about to share it now. Go for it. Yes, let's do this. Is the screen on? Yes. Good. <gülüyor> This is the Sarah Culture House in Kuleftiyov. Well, at least part of it. When it's completed in 2021, it will be 20 stories high, close to 80 meters tall, making it one of the tallest wooden buildings in the world, an architectural landmark for Kuleftiyov, but also for sustainable construction. In 2016, my colleague Robert Schmitz and I won the competition to design the culture center in Kholeftio, which is both a culture center with several theater stages, uh, two art galleries, there's the uh, city library, and then a hotel uh, and a conference center. And they can function on their own like they did before, but also start working in new ways of collaboration and using each other's spaces. Even if you go to see a play, or going to the library, or going to a conference, you'll go to the, the culture center. Combining so many cultural activities in one space is genius. Because it allows people to very easily have a cup of coffee and then, oh, let me go see this piece of art. Or, oh, is there a lunch theater performance now? It, it, it generates accessibility. I would love this to be kind of this experimental kitchen. I think in the kitchen, it's where you gather to do things. These trusses, is it just for decoration or? <laughs> no. No, no. They're, they're filling a function. Uh, it's, a, it's a hybrid between steel and uh, timber. Uh, and we, here we want to illustrate how the timber ta is good on taking pressure and uh, steel taking tension. What's unique with the Culture Center in Skellefteå is that not only the slabs and uh, columns and beams are made from solid timber, but uh, even the elevator shafts. So all of the supporting elements of the structure are made from timber, and that's unique for a building of this height. All the hotel rooms are pre-manufactured um, timber pods, really, coming on site just assembled uh, and stacked on top of each other. Uh, and I think that's an innovation and that's some kind of record as well. And they're stacked 13 stories uh, on, on top of each other. In the main entrance, we have uh, an oversized staircase, which we call the culture staircase. It belongs to everyone. This is an indoor public space that we're creating. Launching a competition for a cultural house, it's part of a strategy that uh, Sholeftio has had for quite a while. It's about growing, it's about development, it's about attracting uh, more people. We are now 72,000 people, but we have this plan to grow to 80,000, 2030, but now we are setting the goal higher to 100,000. And uh, the cultural center is one of the core purposes that will drive an interest and attraction for people to move here. We knew that Kholeftiu is a wooden city with a strong tradition with timber buildings. If you could make a timber building in this size, you could do it here. I think they have the, the guts to, uh, to go through with it. So all of the timber in the building is very locally sourced and it travels a very short way to the factory where it's being transformed into planks. So everything is being made in or around Skellefteå. We have a good wooden industry and by developing that people can actually stay and live their lives 
in Schleswig. What we're trying to achieve in Schleswig is a sustainable city built for people. I would say the main advantage of building in wood uh, is the climate effect it has, that it's minimal. When we're using wood, instead of emitting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, we're actually taking it out, putting it into the building and locking it in. This building is a showcase for sustainable design and, and how to build in timber. And I think this is going to become a game changer for the industry and rapidly uh, change the development of how to build sustainable. My expectations of this building is that it will collaborate in a great way with the rest of the city that it will actually be part of the city dialogue. For me, it's giving a face to what we want to achieve. And I think it's a lovely building. I love it. So I've lived in this city for eight years, and I now live here permanently. I bought a house here, and I tell all my friends in Stockholm that this is the city of the future. In every city, you can probably pinpoint one building that has really changed the path of the development, I'd say. And here it is most definitely this building, because from this building come so many opportunities from an economical, ecological and social point of view. That's great production. It also worked. The television uh, program. In a... This is part of. of um... <laughs> <laughs> Someone started speaking, sorry. So, this is oh. a Swedish institute that I've produced together with Architect Sweden. And it's part of uh, an international exhibition called the Wood Life Sweden that you saw on the, at the end that is going to start touring, um, I think, quite soon after, in the beginning of 2021. Um, Great, Great. Yes. thank you for sharing. Uh, it was, uh, we actually watched it without any um, interruptions, so that was great. Perfect, yeah. good. Yeah. Um, so we'll, we'll go back into the presentation to give you more of a background to the project. Yeah, run through okay. the project. Uh, as was mentioned on the video, this was an open competition. Uh, uh, in 2000, started in 2015, and uh, we had just started our uh, uh, research lab timber uh, at our company White. So this was, we said that this, this project was going to be our, like, uh, uh, yeah, the first project that we, we, we wanted to investigate of how far can we go uh, in, with a timber building. Uh, before uh, this project, there's only been uh, housing projects, basically, or mid-sized mid residential projects going on in Sweden. And uh, here we saw the opportunity to really try to, to make a public building being built with timber. And because uh, uh, th this project has to fulfill the, the, the program of, of a very, very complex program with different functions, but we wanted to make this in, in timber and be viable. And, uh, yeah. and as, this is the Skellefteå. Uh, as you can see, this is the Skellefteå River. And uh, it's uh, quite a small city. It's about 70, a little bit, a bit over 70,000 inhabitants. And it's, it's lying along the Skellefteå River uh, because this was an old uh, timber city really so these vast forests around surrounding it uh, was actually the uh, the reason why the city is there from the first place uh, and shipping timber down south to to the bigger cities of, of Sweden and uh, it's in a rural place uh, far away from from all other cities in, in Sweden quite north uh, just below the surface 
uh, polar circle. And so it suffers from depopulations. People, young people want to uh, move into bigger cities uh, to find work, for example. Uh, so they need to do something and change their, uh, this down, uh, downwarding spiral and uh, to invest in their, in their city and, and to make it more attractive and to attract uh, both people and companies and prices. Um, yes. So David, um, since the city uh, has this uh, uh, timber industry and uh, locally uh, lo locally produced timber, uh, they have their own timber strategy put by the municipality, uh, which is a, a combination of uh, or a triangular combination of academia, business, and municipality working together to become a more sustainable uh, city or a region wood for a sustainable society. And with this in mind, they launched this uh, competition. Uh, and, but they didn't say that uh, we had to make Sara Culture Center in timber. We just say that we want to, uh, we, we're in, in our study is to try, at least try to see if it is possible. Uh, and that, that was the thing that we took into consideration while doing the, the proposal. And there is also a local tradition in, uh, since this is old uh, timber buildings, in heritage buildings, uh, just uh, outside of the city center. And uh, these were actually made of, uh, um, from, um, this is more like, more or less hotels in the old days where people come from, from the, uh, from, from up, from around the, uh, uh, the city to go to church on Sundays. So they came on Saturdays and they met everyone and slept in these cottages and they, they went to mass on Sundays. So this is something that uh, we, we, we also want to, to bring back with the new, uh, with the new culture center and hotel. Uh, so repeating the history and put it into a context uh, situation. And the site, uh, so this is the last unbuilt site in the city center uh, where this culture center is going to stand. Uh, today it works as a bus, uh, or today it's a building site, but before this uh, it worked as a bus station. Uh, so there will be a new train station coming up and uh, so we situated the, the, the culture center right between the train station and the main square. And here you can see that it's not, it's not a, a big city. It's only uh, about five uh, blocks uh, wide and down to uh, the Holeta River. Um, and so this is the last, uh, the, the last, uh, uh, lost uh, site and it's gonna mend the, the quarter, the, the, the blocks. And, and, and really give this uh, a more uh, city-like um, situation. So then this, the program is quite vast. It's, uh, it's 30,000 square meters and it, it fills the entire city block, which is quite, um, for, especially for the collective, quite a big city block. And here our, uh, uh, the, um, the task was really to uh, adapt to the surrounding city scale to this building and, and uh, how we worked with these different volumes uh, to break, to break the, the block up and, and, and give, uh, give facades and, and, and towards the city and, and also work with the, with the high rise and, and where to put it. So it aligns the, uh, the, the main square and the scale of that. And, the, and as you can see, this is, um, the surrounding buildings aren't that high. Uh, they're only four to five stories, but this is the start of a, a bigger city trans, uh, transformation. Uh, so there will be much more taller building here quite soon. And they're already starting to build in the next door, next uh, blocks. Uh, so this is gonna be a, a change of the uh, skyline of Hueleftio, which is also this is, part of. This is a good overview as well of one of the keys to, to realizing this in timber that we launched very early on in the, in the competition that um, given the acoustic requirements of, of putting large theater stages for concerts in the same building as hotel rooms and offices and the library etc. Um, 
we've had to be extremely smart with, with how we plan the spaces um, to, to make it as simple as possible. Um, I mean, had this been done with concrete, with all the know-how that we've amassed over the last hundred years of designing building with concrete, you could almost have put everything as you wanted and you know, solved everything um, with technical solutions that exist. Those solutions don't exist today for timber buildings. So we had to be very cautious on how we plan the building and putting everything in its own location. So every volume that you see here is adapted to its own content. Uh, it's hosting a space or a kind of space that has its specific requirements and they're put side by side. That was the motto of the competition. So it's a very rational plan uh, at the core that has made, <laughs> yeah, that has made the, the kind of the, the, the, the travel or the, the journey to the finished projects possible in timber. And since this is a public building, uh, we also wanted to address the, uh, the surrounding street and to be uh, to involve all the people uh, in the collective visitors and, and people who are actually just passing by. And not everyone is uh, interested in culture here. Uh, these parts of uh, the world in, and in Sweden, hockey is the, the uh, is, is their main goal and, and their church really. So, uh, and so this should also attract everyone to be interested. So that, therefore, we use a, a lot of glazed facades to really visualize uh, the interior and to to make uh, to try to, to lure people into the building. Um, if you're looking at the plan, so this is the uh, level one. It's the main entrance towards this uh, uh, main square. Here we have the uh, hotel lobby and uh, city library, which will give life all around the clock. <laughs> uh, uh, which uh, during daytime, the library will be filled with people and, and the hotel lobby will work 24 uh, hours a day. So there will also be uh, live there as well. And in between the, those, we have put the, the culture staircase, as we call it. It's uh, open, generous uh, space, which is not programmed to anyone or any, any, any, anywhere, any, any one of the different functions within the building. Uh, so this is uh, going to be the place where you can sit down and uh, you don't have to pay for uh, getting in here. So it's just fulfilling this um, purpose of uh, Meeting people, interact, uh, looking looking at the, um, in the surroundings, and maybe you can go into the library, uh, or you can. We're standing in the hotel lobby now. We're looking up towards the the theater foyer, which is uh, above uh, on level two, and you access the, uh, the this space uh, right under the high rise. So you you will be in this void uh, under, underneath underneath this uh, wooden high rise. Uh, where you can see the the uh, the pillars in in, in the glue lamp supporting the high supporting the high rise and they will be in there quite massive it's about thousand uh, one meters times eighty centimeters uh, thick uh, so this is a really interesting space wow. yeah I, that just lovely. when I was wondering how do they go these spans uh, with wooden structure and this image comes this is really uh, yeah this great. is this this image is from the competition. And uh, as you saw in the video, it looks about the same, actually. Yeah, yeah, it does actually. Yeah. So it's uh, yeah, it's been it's it's going to be in a really impressive space. Yeah. Uh, and, and this is the melt <laughs> town. This is where all people will will meet. And this is since the, it's a quite small city, I guess the entire city will be able to meet in here as well. Uh, in the end. Uh, if you go up the stairs, you come to the, to the foyers, uh, and here the most of the stages are for performing arts. We, on, on this floor, we have four of them, uh, and the biggest is uh, for one, 1,200 uh, seats about. And then there is also two uh, black box uh, versions of uh, which you can, you can do anything really with. Uh, and on the other side, there is a back of house production with workshops and. Uh, and uh, everything to support uh, theater. Uh, we also have a museum and art gallery on this uh, floor, uh, with, with, which are all connected through these foyers. So basically all the different operations in this building can work uh, uh, one time, uh, one on one or together, uh, depending on uh, what they want. And but the thing that we wanted to with this project was they wanted to interact with each other to make better collaborations. 
uh, using these, these foyers as, uh, as flexible spaces. Um, for example, the exhibition space can use the, the, the grand foyer for, for bigger uh, exhibitions, or maybe the, the theater can move out to the foyers as, as well. Or the exhibition can use the one of the stages for a performance, and the and then the the uh, the theater can move out to the, and work on the uh, and, and have have place on uh, and place on uh, on the city uh, or the uh, um, the cultures there. So it's a very flexible space, and as you said, it was it's a very simple plan, uh, um, which is allows for different types of use and different types of. Uh, um, yeah, uh, and here is a, a, a picture of uh, one of the main, all uh, the main entrance, uh, looking down towards the main uh, main square. And here we worked. We, our ambition was to, to really use the uh, exposed timber throughout the entire culture center. Uh, back then, we didn't know how much uh, exposed timber we were allowed to use, so that's been a really um, a challenge to. Uh, to investigate to, both for us as we, as we wanted for the architecture but also for the for the, the fire engineers and the construction uh, engineers to solve. I'm just realizing what a feat of uh, structural engineering this is actually. If you yeah. think about, yeah, think yes. about it, the, uh, the structural engineer should be sitting just next to you here because actually he did. <laughs> it's, so he's, they, a hero. he's a hero. Huh? Yeah. Uh, we were, yeah, we were in, I mean, the, the entire project work uh, is based on collaboration, I would say, and, and saying that taking away your, your specific hat of expertise and, and thinking together to create these uh, uh, solutions. Uh, I'm guessing you're working with a local uh, engineer, like Swedish. So we've actually had three structural engineering companies on the project. Um, we, we initially worked with a structural engineer from Oslo, Florian Kosher. He's German, but he's based in Oslo. He was working on the conceptual design with us, mm -hmm. um, creating these trusses, but mainly the concept for the structure. And then uh, when we moved into realization, um, uh, the structural engineer is actually local, um, previously tied to the production, uh, the timber production um, um, company. Um, but now they're they're independent, so they were more into the detailing of this of the structure. And then there's been a third structural engineer that's been an outsider making second um, opinions, second opinions on everything because Checking. Um, to calculate the high rise, there was actually no method of calculating this entirely in timber. So the the Brian Kosher, they actually developed a, a software to calculate the structure. And then I mean, uh, since this hasn't been done before, we've had to to there's been a strength having multiple companies involved. Yeah. Uh, checking each other's calculations, making sure that so it wasn't because you got tired of the first one and then got another one and then tired of the no, second. No, no, no, not at all. <laughs> there have been uh, uh, no, no. We we we thought that it was this is going to work from the beginning, but I mean, since since it's never been done before and there is no uh, yeah. president studies mm -hmm. or uh, we the client really wanted to be sure, of course. Um, so it's been yeah, that's that's been a, a huge challenge as well. Just trying to understand, uh, first to understand how to calculate uh, and then to calculate to get the same results. <laughs> but the, the thing that intrigues me is that you have these very large spans underneath uh, a tower, which is a relatively small span. So the, the tower is actually spanning in the image before with, with the great hall space. The tower is right above this um, yes. area. Yes. So this is actually a transfer structure then. What we're looking at. There yeah, are... there, is, there is another floor above this that's also uh, helps uh, transferring the forces down to mm -hmm. the, the pillars. Right. Uh, so but this, separate... this helps as well. Yeah, there's a floor of transfer structure and then yeah. the which is used for and um, it's a, it, basically okay. it, it, it's a, a floor for, for uh, transferring uh, uh, with trusses, but this yeah. is also a, um, a plant uh, floor or for technical services. Okay. So we're using it. I don't think we have the section. But maybe I think it's coming. Or later maybe on it comes. Yeah. On, yeah. So no. uh, we can. No. So, but this is uh, this is not the main entrance. <laughs> <laughs> this is the the, the main stage uh, stage one, 
and it's a multi multi purpose use uh, stage for up to 12 up to 1500 uh, people when the retractable uh, seats are taken away and, and these uh, we, we this is also something that we wanted to uh, make in so everything here is made from timber uh, the supporting walls the uh, uh, all the uh, balconies and the, the, the seat rows uh, and, uh, and also into the stage area as well. And these, uh, these walls, they are made from CLT, of course, uh, and they come in, in up to 27 meter uh, tall slabs. Uh, so there was, that was one of the first uh, slabs that came into the, uh, to the construction site was one of these wall parts uh, elements that were, was erected. Uh, and these was oh, helps uh, taking down uh, shear loads and forces from the high rise and, and distribute distributes them throughout the entire uh, the block. So all all all of the different uh, walls and, and and functions in this building, they are connected, yeah. both programmably but also structurally, mm. and and helps helps out to to to, to support each other. And then. Uh, the other thing that we did with uh, to to enable this high rise was to create this uh, hotel layout with two cores instead of one core in the middle, which we we have made in the conventional uh, concrete uh, projects. And you can see them at each end of the uh, the plan, uh, holding uh, to save time and and to save money. We we also suggested that each hotel room was to be made of uh, uh, 3D pods, basically, stacked on top of each other and be supported between those two cores. Which, yeah, so, and th this was, uh, th there was something that we, we um, suggested early on in, in the uh, competition. And this is a quite of an extreme example of prefabrication because the bathroom is made in one factory um, with all of the tiles, uh, uh, tiling, and uh, the shower is mounted, the toilet is mounted inside, on site. That's then transported to this factory where the timber structure is put together. Uh, the facade is put on, uh, all of the piping is made, uh, installations, electricity, etc. And this is then packaged and sent on site on a trailer. Uh, and they're just stacked on each other. So it's a prefabricated bathroom in a prefabricated room. <laughs> that goes onto the site and is being stacked. So it's an extremely quick mounting time on site. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. so the, yes. do That's... each of the um, prefabricated rooms act as the structure for the one above? They just sit on top of each other? Yeah, exactly. So There's no, uh, no other yeah. structure for this except for the, the, the elevator shafts that take the, the lateral loads, but the vertical loads are, are taken with these. Um, I don't see if you see, do you see our mouse cursor? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so these are uh, CLT elements. The the walls, the the, the floors, and the ceiling, uh, and and on each end or each corner, there is a glue lamp pillar mm -hmm. holding it. But they're self-bearing. Right. This is the first prototype that was done. So we d we quite early in the process, we we singled this module out. We made uh, construction drawings for it, and then it was built, and then. It was visited by all stakeholders, the hotel, the owner, us, uh, and uh, we looked at everything, how it was done and how it could be done more efficiently since we were going to make 205 other rooms the same way. Uh, if you could save a little time or, or um, uh, eradicate a mistake at this stage, it would uh, heighten the quality. So, uh, And the prototype is actually going into the building. So there's one room that's going to be there that's a bit different. And then there's 204 rooms that are a better version of that first one. <laughs> And to clarify, you also put the facade on the modules. Yeah. As well. So the the so the um, facade is not an independent uh, load. No. It's part of the modular system. That yeah. was really cool. The the, the, cl the climate uh, facade is uh, is part of the and also part of the structure to hold yeah, it. Yeah, it's part uh, of the structure. In outside, isn't there? As far as I can tell, you have a double facade. Don't double yeah. facade. So this yeah. is the inner part of and and the climate. Um, what do you call it? Yeah, yeah. This this is the actual facade that's that's hermetic yeah. for for temperature and for water exactly. Yeah. And then the outer skin is mounted on site. Um, right. We were we were looking into having both both facades uh, uh, 
being assembled uh, off site. But in the end, it was too uh, complicated. So we, the outer one is uh, being uh, put on afterwards. Perhaps you're going to explain to us how the double facade works in the environmental systems. Uh, yeah, sure. Later. <laughs> uh, and here you can see a little bit about how the uh, connections uh, in, in the uh, hotel uh, modules and see how they are uh, connected in the ceiling by screwing plates to, to put them in order. So they're not touching each other except for these two uh, screwing plates. Uh, because of the risk of the flank transmissions uh, throughout the wall. So there is basically, uh, basically there is a CLT uh, and then there is 100 millimeters uh, air, which is filled with um, insulation. And then there is the next wall, which is what- do you, what, what do you mean by flank uh, transmissions? It's, um, it's like when these walls, uh, when there's noise in one of these pods, the noise goes into the wall. Um, and since these are our entire kind of wall, uh, elements, uh, wall elements, uh, they, they cap quite a lot of noise. And uh, this is basically the most difficult thing about timber construction is that you need to, every, is the connections. You need everything to be stiffly connected to handle the loads, but then you get an, an acoustic issue and in many projects you solve this by having stiff connections you have flank transmissions but then you clad the timber on the inside with either a freestanding wall uh, gypsum boards or a hanging ceiling but in these pods we actually have exposed clt the actual structural clt is exposed on walls and ceiling so what you see here is what you get uh, in you just put the, the bed here yeah. and then, the, then they're finished. Yeah, so, so we've minimized basically the, the connection so that the transfer of noise is minimal um, between the groups. And, and this is something that we, uh, we early in the process, we, we set up to say that we want to, to be as uh, efficient with the materials possible, um, working with material optimization. So uh, using the, the elements of construction as, uh, as architectural features and uh, ornamentation throughout the entire building, hence the, uh, the, uh, the trusses, the, the timber trusses in the foyers, for example. And this is also something that we, of course, we could have cladded this with, with the gypsum afterwards, but that was not of our interest because since we're doing this uh, 3D models, uh, we want to, want to, want to see that, uh, and, so we do something that is real uh, and, and, and through thoroughly. Do you mind if I keep asking questions? Um, yeah, co continue. <laughs> I hope you don't mind the interruption. I, I guess that you actually enjoy the interruption, so I'm going to keep going. Yeah. Um, the, one, uh, one question from our um, professor, Yüksel uh, Demir. He, he's saying, have I understood it correctly? The two towers at either end of the hotel um, floor are in concrete, aren't they? No, they are CLT. They're all, it's all timber, isn't it? There's no yeah, everything is timber. Yeah, okay, second question. So there's nothing tim concrete here, you've said. No. Uh, the second question that's from uh, Bihter, Bihter Celik is asking, it's a very obvious one. Uh, does this sit on timber foundations or does it sit on concrete? Uh, we have, we looked into that actually. But not, not this project. No, this is uh, this is going to be a, a concrete basement, mm -hmm. and and the uh, the ground floor plate is uh, concrete. Yeah, yeah. Um, but tr but from ground floor up, it's uh, it's timber. We're gonna have we have some uh, uh, slides showing that mm -hmm. later on. But as you know, um, our most beloved Venice is all sitting on timber foundation. So yeah. Um, so we, we, the, the problem here is we have uh, we have gravel and then we have bedrock. Mm. We, don't, we don't have any. Uh, we don't have any water to be able to encapsulate the oxygen. Uh, in, keep in, it stay, yeah, to keep it from yeah. rotting and so on. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, there's, a, there's a cathedral in uh, in England, Bath. You know, I don't know if you know it, Bath Cathedral. Yeah. It's a very tall cathedral. Uh, it's also on timber foundations, and yeah. the main reason why the timber foundations work is because the ground is wet. Yeah, mm. Exactly, uh, and lo lo lots of parts of, of Stockholm is, is that way as well. But here, yeah. um, sadly, uh, right. Yeah. So you would have done it in timber if you could have. Yeah, you would have pushed for that. <laughs> yeah, and I think we've also tried to see this project as as part of a series of projects where you know we've done as much as we can to innovate here, 
um, yeah. we've come quite far. Um, obviously, it's not everything that we have learned throughout the process has gone into the building. Uh, but it is quite interesting when you're talking timber that the comparisons that you make with these very, very old buildings are relevant because it's that kind of knowledge of how timber works that we need to incorporate into these projects, even though they're uh, industrially built. You need to understand how timber acts and reacts um, and, and kind of the way that we've done it before to make sure that these stand the test of time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah. There are many more questions. So if you could continue a bit, maybe, and then we'll interrupt yeah. you again. Yes, so this is also an image from the uh, from the competition and it's uh, I think this looks quite the same as uh, during production. So it is really fun and realizing the uh, our vision becomes um, reality. Um, Beautiful. Yeah, and th then we also wanted to building it because this building has a huge impact of this guideline of what of course, it's going to be more than twice uh, as twice, uh, what do you call it? Double, double height of the of the building, which is the highest building today. Uh, we wanted to give something back, and so we proposed uh, uh, public public um, floor uh, on the top, uh, all level twenty, and it's going to be a spa and a sky bar, uh, enjoying the views overlooking the Kolefli River. Uh, which is which is uh, which make it possible to anyone to get up here and, and enjoying this view. And then I think this is also something socially uh, really important to to do when uh, taking this much really space uh, uh, from the city. Um, yeah, no, I mean we we we did a calculation quite early on um, uh, on the effect of the materials. Uh, only in the production of materials on the C carbon dioxide equivalents. Uh, and this is just, just to sum up that the emissions from producing the material, the concrete and the steel that is in the building, the aluminium, the glass, uh, well, anything that is in timber basically, um, mount up to 8,350 tons, the dark gray number that you see on top. And the uh, timber structure alone, we have timber facade as well, which is quite, uh, quite, uh, quite a large volume of timber, but if the only the structure is about 12,000 cubic um, meters of um, timber uh, is actually sequestering 8,900 tons of CO2 emissions, uh, CO2 equivalents, sorry. Um, so if you only look at the materials, this building actually has a positive impact on the climate. Um, we're, we're starting a second kind of calculation this spring where we're taking into account the, uh, the emissions from the construction site. So the energy that is used on the construction site and then energy in use during life time um, of the building to see uh, whether this could be a carbon neutral building. Uh, oh, positive. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I, I would have thought that this is giving direction to the whole of Sweden's uh, commitments towards the uh, UN. The UN. Yeah, countries. exactly. And, and next year we have to start to do these uh, calculations, initiating yeah. a new project. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you like, it's uh, the uh, the amount of uh, emissions that uh, the uh, structure stores is equivalent to about thirteen thousand uh, round trips from Stockholm to New York. <laughs> so it's quite a lot. <laughs> yes, that, that's a depressing figure. Uh, yeah, I'm yeah. part of I'm part of the community that creates those figures, unfortunately. Uh, but um, yeah. But not us today. <laughs> <laughs> not today. Not today. Not today. <laughs> today we're doing very well. I think this is a very carbon uh, conscious presentation here. You yeah. are sitting, you're sitting so, where you are. <laughs> so of course we have a lot of focus in uh, the building material and we're using timber as uh, the sole material uh, for, for highlighting this as a energy of uh, the sustainable building but we're also using with smart building energy throughout the the energy light uh, lifetime yeah and, and i think so what we've tried to do is kind of focus the entire sustainability strategy around timber to make sure that any other systems that we put in help highlighting timber as a construction material so um one of the the keys for the design is transparency uh and making uh the the, the, the hotel tower is 100 percent glass uh with a double skin uh, that's not uh, usual to do today in northern Sweden when it comes to energy efficiency, but working with um, uh, hybrid ventilation for the large uh, spaces in the culture center, we've been able to reduce the 
size of the uh, mechanical ventilation, both the energy use and investment. Um, so that when there's a lot of people and a lot of heat, uh, you can actually use natural ventilation to uh, evacuate the hot air. Um, we have uh, a comprehensive external sun shading uh, for the lower part and for the hotel as well. Um, and this is mobile sun shading because in Cholefteo during the winter, I think in about a week or so, the sun will set and it won't go up for two or three weeks at all. Uh, and in the summer, it's the opposite. So the sun rises uh, end of June and it doesn't go down for three weeks. So you have extreme differences in light conditions. Mm. And if you were to make a simulation and say, okay, uh, how should we work with the glazing on a project like this? You would end up with 50% glazing. But that would mean that during the summer, you would have way too much light. And during the winter, you would not have enough anyway. So uh, we're working with this 100 uh, mobile sun sunscreening that can basically block every all light out for the entire hotel. Uh, it can also let all of the light in during the, the winter time if you want. Um, so it's, it's a building that adapts somehow. There's also some uh, photovoltaic cells on the top uh, floors and the roofs. Um, and this has been a, a big question up here as well, because uh, Cholefteo is a city with abundant green energy. There is hydro uh, energy uh, locally. So the entire urban grid is powered by 100% green energy. So that kind of lowers the um, uh, incentives for the developers here to, to, to actually produce energy on the building. And we thought that, yes, we need to have some photovoltaics to integrate into this, but uh, mainly we get very clean energy from the outside as well, and we need to take that into account. But what has been done instead is, is an energy system that is uh, the, the, the Highline uh, smart grid, uh, so that the building is connected to the city. Uh, it's, it's aware of how other buildings are using energy at, at the moment, if there is any electric bus being charged, et cetera, and it adapts. And the building is actually tuned not to lower the costs for this individual building, but to lower the peaks in the grid. So whenever there is a lot of um, heat uh, in the winter, for example, in many of the buildings around this building, it can actually disconnect from the grid and use geothermal energy as well. Even if it were um, more expensive, it can get green energy on its own, making sure that the urban grid does not have to switch over to fossil fuels uh, to manage the peak. And in the same way, it has an artificial intelligence uh, system installed that learns how the building acts. So uh, for instance, when there's a concert planned, uh, the building will actually learn what needs that, uh, that concert will, will mean, and it can cool down air ahead of time and store it in other spaces and then use that cooled air to kind of reduce the peak loads uh, in the building. And it works with the same with the water um, and the air within the building. So it's, um, it's a very efficient um, mm. way of working anyway. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a new way of working and yeah. uh, interacting the building into in this entire city grid. Uh, so you're not... actually, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, can I? interrupt here with a question. So you have integrated the building with the citywide um, supply of- Yeah, so it's, it's integrated with the, with the district heating and cooling, but also with the electric, electric, electricity yeah. uh, network. Uh, and, and, and the thing that they want through uh, artificial intelligence, they, they, they will know, it, as, as the, um, the electricity company says, it, says a, it has ears and it has a, and a heart. Uh, this building to understand what's going on around it. Yeah. So and and the, and the project is also having batteries instead of uh, in, in diesel uh, aggregators. So yes, I was going to say, do you have a lot of batteries, presumably. Yes. Building. Yes. That's a that's a given. But yeah. um, can I ask a question about the double skin facade of the tower? Um, yeah, sure. It's also connected to the finishes of the timber. I, let me ask that question first. How do you finish the uh, the timber that? Yeah, is, uh, I think. Do you put any finish on it, or is it self finished? So, so the facades. Yeah, um, it, it, it's two facade systems. In in the low rise, we have we have uh, of course glazed uh, facades, and the ribs are from uh, Galula. Um, but then we have the the uh, the, the cladded the, the timber cladded facades are uh, from spruce. Right. Yeah. Uh, and and they are uh, they are treated with a slightly uh, um, uh, it's a rest product from from doing 
what they are heated. It's an impregnation process yeah. that uses minimal amounts uh, of, um, of, of of mineral products that is injected into the wood, or press, pressure uh, treated. Pressure, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that doesn't affect, it, it only makes that it protects it from rot, basically. But yeah. the surface is, is aging as an untreated wood. So it's going to go yeah. silver, anything that's exposed. That's what I was asking. So, yeah. you, so it, will be, it, it will be whitened and, and, and silver. Yeah. Uh, so and then there is the high rise. And, and uh, could we, we, one, one uh, choice that we made from the high rise is that we want to expose these two uh, timber cores so there wouldn't be any questions that they are not being made of timber. Yeah. That's the, the previous question said that it might be from concrete. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so, so there we what you see in from inside uh, the uh, the double skid facade is actually the the uh, is the CLT slab that holds the building, and there it's it's only um, fire retarded treatment mm -hmm. on that one. Yeah, but that will also go gray eventually because it's ultraviolet light that it's going to have a slower process because yeah. because it's going to be protected from by from uh, from air and from uh, from uh, outdoor climate through yeah. the glass glass. But of course, there will be a process there as well. Yeah. But yeah. And also within this fire treatment that we put on that is is transparent and entirely matte, it, there's also UV protection. So um, the internal uh, timber structures uh, will not. Uh, become as yellow and then uh, it won't darken and it won't become silver as fast. It's going to take a yeah. very, very long time. So it might be yellow. Yeah. On, uh, upon delivery, everything is going to have the same tone, external yeah. and internal. And then over time, everything that's exposed is going to become silver while the rest remains kind of this gold, uh, golden pine. Yeah. Uh, but it, let's say uh, 50 years later, the level of yellowness will be deeper, presumably, won't it? Inside. It, yeah. Inside. yeah. It'll be a we, we, we, we, we, we're in, and for the panels inside, uh, we're using uh, a, a pigment, a white pigment, to uh, to lighten it, yeah. to lighten it a bit. But of course, it will, will become, it will be more uh, as old timber will be. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it will age be very nice. Gracefully. Yeah, it will age gracefully, like us old us old guys are yeah. slowly going gray, <laughs> silvery gray on the outside. Yeah. Okay. So, so we have more slides to go, right? And yeah, a, a few, but not that many, I think. No yeah, problem. No. We have lots of good questions, actually. Oh, good. And then so, I'm going to move to questions after you finish. So if we quickly run through the structural system and, and, and how this has been assembled, this building. Uh, as we were talking about earlier, we have a concrete foundation in the basement. Uh, and it's con connected uh, down to the bedrock. And, but above that, we have uh, CLT and walls and uh, glue lamp columns, basically, around it. Uh, and then in the high rise, it's uh, made from pre-manufactured 3D CLT modules, and they're stacked for 13 stories, which I think it's a record in itself. Uh, and above that, uh, we have two, uh, uh, two floors of uh, concrete, uh, but this is to, uh, to reduce the, the swayness of, of the building. Uh, we don't need it for uh, for um, structures for the construction, uh, and in our next project, we will we'll use a damper instead, and, and then we will be able to actually uh, do all the all the timber floors in all the floors in timber. Mm. And the, here you can see the cross laminated timber parts. Uh, we're using it for course uh, shear walls, floor slabs, and the the hotel modules. And uh, here is the glue laminated timber with the, with the beams and the columns. And the, here, here is the, the uh, section <laughs> where you can see the installation for. Uh, and we have used a lot of standardizing floor heights because this project is, of course, uh, has a budget. And we have restricted budget as well. So we're trying to use as few uh, elements as possible throughout the, the project. And, and since in the, in the beginning, and then we have developed different types uh, throughout the process. But uh, we, we try to use the minimum, minimize the number of different uh, heights and volumes. Yes. And a little bit about the fire treatment uh, and the... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, since there's, uh, I, I think you raised it earlier as well, there's always questions about fire and timber and we're not so used to, to timber buildings, especially not tall timber buildings. Uh, we've had to put in several systems that are somehow redundant. Um, the entire building is sprinklered. 
uh, and the sprinkler is redundant in itself. So basically this means that there will never be a fire in this building. It will be extinguished uh, uh, basically instantly. Um, the uh, hotel tower is also designed um, with evacuation staircases that uh, allow for a, a sufficient amount of people to get out of the, the building quite fast. There's evacuation lifts and it's rated uh, BR0 um, with an R, uh, R90 uh, system for the tall one. So uh, for one hour and a half, it's supposed to withstand a full fire uh, so that everyone can be evacuated uh, safely. Uh, the culture center has a lower fire rating, uh, anything that's not participating in stabilizing the high rise. So it's an R60 or R30, depending on the parts. So 60 or 30 minutes uh, of fire resistance. And then all of the entire wood, uh, internal wood surfaces are coated uh, with an anti-flame um, surface. So uh, it's, it, it cannot really catch fire. It won't participate in, in the fire either, uh, but that's more for personal safety. And of course, there's a lot of cost involved in all of these things because, I mean, the sprinkler costs, the uh, treatment of the internal surfaces costs as well. And the R90 um, uh, design basically means that everything is made slightly larger. So when there is a fire, uh, uh, a column that uh, needs a specific um, uh, size to, to hold the tower, uh, it, it actually has about four or five centimeters more of wood that can burn away before the building yes, crumbles. So there's more material in the building as well. And this is something I think will be developed in further projects where maybe you won't have to have all of these systems at once. Um, but this is a kind of a comprehensive um, fire treatment uh, plan for the building. Yeah, so there's a lot lots of parts mm. being uh, parties but being involved in this project. And, mm. uh, but here we can see the construction time plan, and uh, and as you can see, the uh, the concrete uh, ground slab is 25 weeks, and the, the entire timber construction is 52 weeks. So half of the time, uh, that it's like one third is the concrete uh, ground slab. So it's this uh, when when this is done, the entire timber construction goes very quickly and uh, I think we have about saved about half of 50 percent of the uh, construction time using timber instead of uh, a conventional um, method. What's By doing the, this we have to uh, we, we, and we are not uh, we're not using any tents uh, doing the construction instead we we are um, dividing this project into a lot of I think it's 13 different zones actually uh, erecting each each part uh, quickly so that we have a, a roof on and then we start with the next section what's the time prior to this program uh, in the factory uh, so there's this is the program on site 124 weeks on site yes it's yes. just two years so before that two years uh, what's the time uh, no, they, they they started the uh, the uh, the C the CLT slabs and when they started the concrete ground slab when we started digging in the ground basically, so there's been really uh, uh, so there is no uh, that is also something that's been uh, uh, challenging and and and also uh, uh, we we we have tried lots of different types of floor slabs in this project. We have used a combination with uh, with concrete and timber, for example. But in the end, we we uh, we ended up with using only timber, and one of the reasons was because it was much quicker. We don't need any waiting times. We don't need any drying times. Uh, when, when, for example, when you're using uh, concrete. So uh, um, I think the speed in the high rise. I think you can do one floor floor a week with the good conditions. Now it's been if it doesn't. Um, it's rain or uh, it's too windy, but it's, uh, so it goes very quick, very quickly to assemble this um, project. Uh, we've been working a lot of with, uh, with BIM and the workflow as a method and uh, throughout the entire building um, design process. Uh, we started with BIM directly after the competition, uh, having this uh, 3D model, um, um, taking up different types of um, sustainability reports and uh, calculations. We used it as a virtual reality to and visualizations to our client and also to for the municipality and, and for the people uh, renting, they're going to rent the place. Well, uh, <laughs> we have uh, working since um, 
the uh, um, design team is in Stockholm. It's about 800 kilometers uh, from uh, Skellefteå. And uh, the uh, construction uh, uh, guys, they, they're, they're from Norway. So they've been really useful with these uh, 360 panorama on site uh, feedback, uh, which we can, we can watch through uh, these monitors and see uh, what's going on on site. And looking on um, uh, to see what if it's done as uh, our uh, drawings. Uh, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of innovations within the within this project as well. Uh, everything from um, acoustic panels in the uh, in the main theater to uh, looking into different types of uh, windstopper in in uh, in the cork uh, using in in the outdoor in the outer uh, walls to this uh, um, double skin facade, working with uh, looking into investigating how the uh, how the air will be exhausted. Now it's advancing on its own, but yeah. <laughs> I think it's, it's, it's interesting because one of the things here you can say, maybe you can pause it, yeah, yeah. Uh, is that uh, in order to realize this building in timber, we've uh, had to, to set all of our minds into an kind of an innovation mode. Uh, and realizing that, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna meet challenges that we have solutions for with conventional methods, but we need to kind of leave that uh, way of thinking and and find new solutions for everything. And once you've you've started thinking that way, you realize that you can solve other issues uh, in different ways as well. And that's one of the reasons why the smart grid was developed. It's yeah. like this is a, a timber building. We need to do something more about the energy system. Uh, and the uh, the double skin facade was one area where we did a lot of. Um, research, uh, we ended up having these spaces ventilated uh, uh, independently. So every floor is ventilated uh, on its own from the outside to evacuate hot air in the summer. Uh, and we have these uh, sun, sh sun, uh, sun shades in the interstitial area. So they are not uh, uh, exposed to wind and water, but they're not uh, amassing heat inside either. But we actually looked into uh, kind of amassing hot air within the double skin and pushing it around the building to create kind of a hot air cushion. And, and we've been able to make lots of research projects within the, the project like this, thanks to the fact that it's in timber. Uh, we initially thought, okay, so this is a timber building, that's what we're gonna focus on and everything else is gonna be standard, but it's actually been the opposite. That yeah. Timber has led the way for more innovations. And, and I think that it, it's, been triggering the entire group of uh, everything from the contractor to, and the client uh, wanting to, because everyone is working, uh, we had the mindset that this is going to be a, a functional building and a rational building. So it's, in, in the end, it was quite easy to, to see these adjustments working. I would, in, in I would just like to um, remind us that we are coming quite close to the end. Okay, I, I think we are, uh, this is our last slide. And just mm -hmm. this is just uh, some uh, images from the uh, construction site. And here you see the, uh, the main square, uh, the main uh, uh, theater. Uh, and uh, this is a drone uh, image. And you can see the, how far the, uh, the tower is gone. Uh, I think last week we, uh, we reached uh, the peak in construction. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, just in a, in a few uh, weeks, we have the entire uh, high rise will be erected. Mm. Would you go for a topping out party? Yeah. <laughs> on Zoom? Yeah, Probably. on Zoom, yes. <laughs> Since the corona, we're not allowed to go out to, to visit the site, sadly. Yes. And this is the last slide. Uh, it's a Christmas card from Philefty to you guys. Yeah. <laughs> It's very nice. I mean, I, I, I, if there was an audience here, they would be doing this. Ah, uh, it was. <laughs> Thank you, guys. And the, excellent, the audience, excellent presentation. The audience is obviously here. Uh, you can't see from uh, our screen because we're on Zoom, but on the Hopin screen, you can see that there are over 100 people watching right now. Uh, so there's been quite a lot of interest and there are a few questions. And it's a lot of questions, actually. I kind of organized the questions from the order of about building and then about your practice. Uh, maybe we can finish off the building questions first. Yeah. Uh, I think we have a bit of extra time we can use after this, but not much, so. Yeah, do we have uh, extra time, Tolgahan? <laughs> I think secretly we do, a we little do. bit. Okay. okay. Um, Okay, so Arkut Sanjar is wondering, 
Hi, I wonder how you integrate uh, ready-made products, which are visually very different from your general material choice, timber, into your buildings. What I try to say is construction material industry is so intertwined with uh, metal and concrete, all flashing subframes, claddings, even doors are generated for this type of industry. Yeah. It must be so difficult to find the right materials and even negotiate with the manufacturers. Yeah, the, a great the, question. There was a big question, but I think the the uh, our solution was to very early uh, get involved to the manufacturer to understand what uh, what uh, boundaries we had working with CFT plates. Uh, we work with we we know how to work with uh, uh, with concrete prefab concrete, for example. And we have different we have certain measurements that we need to adapt to. And then. Uh, but here there was, we have worked with, um, we couldn't just generalize everything because everything is actually tailored to this project. And, but then when you understand that, that then it's, and, and you understand the, the chain of production. So then you, then you need to know, you, there, there is a certain time uh, in the process that you need to set that this is how we should do it. Uh, I don't know if that answers the question, but, uh, you have to think that it's uh, it's not standardized uh, products yeah. that you're just taking from a, a Lego <laughs> box and put it in. Yeah. We, it, it, you have to come have so much more uh, possibilities and uh, to actually create something. And I think that's something that will be as architects think, think that this is a really good, uh, it's exciting times mm. uh, for for us to to be part. I mean, to be part in in the construction uh, phase as well. So yeah. we, we have to work together with the construction to, to, to make this building be possible. And we have to understand the, um, um, the, the services and, and the electrician, where, where should it go? Because everything is pre-manufactured. So we, we need to do the right drilling at, uh, before, beforehand. We can't just solve it then at, the, uh, at the building site. At the site. site, yeah. But if we, if we did something wrong, and you, I think you have a really good picture of, of that, there is this guy in this uh, chainsaw, so on, just taking something off. And you could never do that with concrete, for example. <laughs> well, when it, when it comes to everything that's not structural in a project like this, it's, I think it's a very relevant question because you realize how much work there is to be done in those sectors as well for sustainability. For, when you look at glass facades, aluminum facades. It challenges them as well, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it challenges them both in the sustainability issue and then, of course, in the more practical way here. I mean, it's the tolerances, that's the big question, and, and understanding how timber behaves so that the interfaces between these function and where does the kind of responsibility division go. But it's manageable. Yeah. Uh, you and, need and, to... and for example, with timber, with, with uh, CLT, uh, there is, the, the tolerances are so much more precise than in concrete. So you can get much more uh, defined buildings and, and, and, and details throughout this. Yeah. That's also an opportunity, uh, working in yeah. timber. Yeah. I have confirmation from Tolgahan that we do have uh, more time because the next event is uh, uh, much later. So we're going to have a break anyway. So you can ask uh, if you guys have time. Do, of course, you if you have time, time <laughs> yeah. Are you okay? okay. I mean, uh, yeah. Uh, there, because yeah. There's, there's quite a collection of questions here. So Yes, I, uh, I'm going to, if you guys are okay, I'm going to move to the next question. Uh, could you give information about the type of wood you use in the construction and which country do you get these timbers from and what types of trees are used in the production of timber elements? All, all the timbers are collected from a radius in 120 kilometers around the, the area, the That's construction area. That's excellent. Wow. Amazing. So it's uh, very locally sourced and, uh, and that's not something that we uh, said because of the, uh, we wanted to make it as sustainable as possible. That's just because the, the, uh, the mill or the, the, uh, the saw, could, that's their adapting uh, area that they use. <laughs> so, uh, and it's- That's uh, nice. That's very good. 100 kilometers is pretty damn good. Yeah. 120. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I mean, what they're saying in Sweden today is that there's no economy in transporting a log more than 200 kilometers, regardless of your, if you're interested in sustainability or not. Uh, and if you look at Sweden, it's also almost a grid of sawmills, uh, all spaced from this, so that the, the forest right. is harvested and then treated quite locally. And then the product you can actually transport, but the log doesn't want to travel too much. Yeah. In Turkey, yeah. we have the opposite. We have concrete manufacturers 
on a grid everywhere. Okay. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> but we're going to try and do what you're doing. That's yeah. our dream. This is and our I mean, dream. It, it, it's a really high tech sawmill as well. The logs comes in and they get the x-rayed to see what's, uh, what's the, the best solution for that log. Uh, and which part that they're going to use for, for different type of product. Uh, so there will be no uh, waste in, in, uh, for, for the material waste and, the, and, and the, everything from uh, uh, um, high detail uh, furnitures to CLT to, uh, uh, for, for heating as well. The, the question product. actually was specific. It said which kind of timber, I mean, uh, spruce you mentioned, uh, spruce and tryptocine, the Google Lama was lazım. Google you mentioned spruce. Yes, yeah, softwood. Really, yes. Which is quite a softwood. Yeah, it? it's a softwood. And it works really well with the CLT. And uh, that's the main uh, that's the main wood, is it? Spruce? Yeah. Lad basically Ladi. that's uh, the only material that we have in the building. We have some other for flooring, we have another uh, just but... need, uh, Ladin. Ladin. Yeah. Ladin, uh, okay. It's the Christmas tree. Yeah. It's the yeah. Christmas tree, yes, yeah. Chama, yeah. Christmas tree. Chama, yeah. So it's actually very um, easy to grow it. Yes. Yeah. It's a, it grows very quickly. Yes. Uh, and you don't have to. Um, I'm not a. Um, you, you don't have to have the the best uh, uh, the quality of of, of, of the, uh, the the timber using when using it in uh, in CLT because yeah. you're you're yeah. using so much uh, material. Yeah. So that's also something that's good for, for that you can use different parts of it of the forest. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, another question, Aicha Thailand is wondering if you use a sustainable insulation material um, in your construction. What is the sustainable insulation material? I'm sure they're using sustainable. No, but like, we, yeah, or what is it? Yeah. Materials do you use? I think what we what, what we showed on one slide quite quickly is that we we, uh, we mainly, look at the hard insulation on the outer, we always have double layers of insulation uh, in, in Sweden because we have very high um, norms for, uh, for, for um, insulation, uh, U-values for the walls. Um, the outer uh, insulation that's usually a hard material, that's often the one that has the biggest climate impact. Uh, and we went quite far in investigating using natural cork for that. It has uh, very good uh, um, characteristics. But uh, unfortunately, we didn't end up uh, putting that into the building. So it's quite conventional insulation, uh, stone wool. Um, uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. Did you don't... look into um, hempcrete at all? Is hempcrete? Yeah. Yeah. The... But I mean, mo most of the facade is uh, glass. Yeah. We, we did look into hemp as well and different materials like that. And then in the end, uh, we, uh, the, the client felt that this was uh, yeah. enough. This was one of the points where it said enough uh, innovation. Let's, uh, let's stick with something we know. Um, there's also in all of this, the, the, uh, the facades that are not glazed, we have solid CLT as well. And that has a quite a good insulating factor as well. So yeah. it's only the, um, the extra insulation that's... Yeah. Can I ask a question, Adrian? Sure. Um, I think somebody else also asked the same question. I think this is probably the biggest question that in everybody's mind, actually, um, which is how much does this building cost in compared, comparison to a quote unquote standard building? If you had done this with, yeah. with concrete or steel or whatever. So the, of course, of course, the uh, uh, our client did a survey uh, looking into quite uh, quite a lot of um, similar projects around um, um, the Scandinavia uh, before before taking the body for this project and uh, uh, and I and and I would say uh, this project is isn't more expensive than than uh, another. This is actually cheaper uh, per square meters than uh, than most of the the uh, pre pre adducats or what do you call it? Yeah. So you would say that it's more or less the same. Yeah. In terms of okay, well, I, I have another very sensitive question, <laughs> which you may not want to answer, but you want, want you want to know what it costs? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I I, okay. I want to know if it's a similar level. That's all. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's important. That is similar to a normal high quality construction process. Yeah, it's, it's, I would say it's cheaper than a high quality. Uh, yeah. okay. But you need to, to kind of put everything together because yeah. if you only look at the structure, the timber structure is most probably gonna be slightly more expensive than a concrete structure. But when you factor in the construction time that you don't have to be yeah. on site for as long, 
uh, the workers on site can work much shorter. And the fact that we've actually removed a lot of the cladding elements inside because we're exposing the timber. We say this, is, this surface is good enough yeah. um, for the theater foyer, for example. We don't need to make a, a, a ceiling, uh, a fancy ceiling um, yeah. to hide the concrete somehow. Then all in all, um, it's uh, yeah, it's coming yeah. cheaper than than the, the conventional projects made these last. Yeah, and, it, and and then you can say this is not a conventional project. It's a very unique project from from the start with a program. Uh, uh, but I would say that I mean, since the history of time, up in uh, especially in, in in the northern parts of of, of the world and Europe, uh, you use timber buildings because it was the cheapest alternative, and you knew how to build it. And this building is the forefront in, in investigating in different types of uh, um, joints and, and, and detailing and, and how to assemble a timber building. And then when this is uh, when you when you have this knowledge, and and you can and and, and in, in every stage of the project, from the client to the architect to the construction guy to the to the service to the uh, to the investor and so on and so on. Uh, I, I think. We, this would compete with this would be a conventional way of building and then it's all the matters about the, the material price and since the, since the demands is is getting higher the uh, the, the investments in new uh, sawmills are uh, are blooming in Sweden uh, so that uh, presses the prices for the for the raw material for example it's yeah so I mean we're at the beginning we're really the beginning of, it, of the new era I would say but I think one, one, one other question about similar tech is um, how long does it take to design? Uh, you know, for, for you, how long was the concept design and the scheme design process of this project? Not the detailing, but how long did you give yourselves for developing the concept and uh, finalizing the scheme design? It was, it was a competition. And the, the competition was about, uh, I think it was eight weeks maybe we had After for submission. The after that, how much time did you spend as a practice um, in designing it? I mean, we have done, uh, I mean, this was, we won this competition in 2016 and we started, so it's, we have been working on this project for, for, for four years, but the concept of the building is the same as it was. Everything has changed, of course, and, yeah. uh, but the concept is, is, is uh, basically the same as it was during the, con uh, after the competition. I think each individual design phase has been very similar to uh, any other project in the office. Um, what has happened is when we got into detail design, um, at, at a few points there were changes made. So we've had to, to kind of redo the detail design uh, with different premises a couple of times. So that has meant more design work for us over the scale because the we've discovered possible, or the client has actually discovered possibilities and new challenges along the way. But each specific design stage uh, has yeah, been see. quite similar to anything else. Yeah. So it took about three years of design though? Not really. I mean, the entire design process from phase one to, to do to technical drawings. And I mean, we have done a lot of, lot of these times we have done uh, working on technical drawings, I would say. Right. So, for the concept, six weeks or eight weeks. Yeah, no, the concept I understood. The reason why I'm asking the question is because a, a project like this requires quite a lot of R and D as you're going. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, well, well, well the, I would say that you need to, uh, and, and and this goes for for all, all projects as it is pre-manufactured with parts. Uh, you need to know what you're doing. <laughs> so the, it's a little bit heavier in the in the in the in the not the design in in the process of taking getting the drawings up, doing a 3D model, uh, looking, we, we had, a, we had, our 3D model contains about 200,000 uh, elements, mm. uh, th this virtual uh, product that we're doing. And we did all the um, colliding and what do you call it? Clash uh, detection. Yeah, in, in that one. And it re the result is that we have hardly had any uh, uh, faults on, on site. So the the so do, doing a little bit more in the doing the design construction or design phase, uh, putting a little bit more effort in there, it, it, it, it ends up helping in the in the end where where you're actually building it. Yeah, Ajay, do you have more questions? Yes, I do. Uh, Great. Okay, uh, I won't rephrase this. I'll just ask this as it is. And as you said, is asking, so if the wood rests on concrete foundation, how can the attachment points be provided firmly? 
how are the environmental effects in this regard? I think he's um, trying to say, um, how can the, how, how do you make the connection? How does it really, yeah. Okay, basically, and yeah. And will it degrade, um, or that will the timber degrade over time? I think that's what I'm understanding. Ah. Maybe is there a uh, adaptive connection to yeah. help that not yeah. happen? Yeah. Because at the end of the day, the timber has to sit on the concrete somehow, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Basically, I, most most of the connections in the project like this are the connections are made with steel. Steel. Yeah. Um, so so to enhance to, to kind of handle the transfer of loads between timber elements, but also between the timber and the concrete. Um, so there is a detail. I'm I'm not sure I can explain it here uh, no, no, on the screen, but between the concrete and the timber that's actually resting on it, where yeah. obviously first and foremost the concrete is raised a little bit underneath every connection point, so that if at some point there is water amassed on the slab, it doesn't actually touch the timber, because of yeah. course the end grain is where it's most susceptible to actually uh, bringing it up. Um, but uh, yeah, we'd have to go into the structural engineer's detail of, of that specific connection to explain or to Let's understand. Open it up. Yeah. But it's, uh, we have an, our, of course, the, our engineers has uh, assured us that this will stand for at least 100 years without any. Uh... Oh. That was actually another question, I think. Uh, um, has the life cycle cost analysis of the building been done? If so, can you tell us a little bit about that? After how long does it cover the cost of the production? It hasn't been finalized yet. So we've done preliminary calculations of carbon dioxide and, and of economy as well. Um, but we didn't want to finish them unless uh, until we actually knew exactly how the construction was going to be conducted because this has, has changed until the last minute, basically, how everything's done on site. But um, I think basically this project, apart from the timber, it, it's in, it goes into the similar process of LCA as any other project yeah, with yeah. an investment uh, assessment um, and the payoff. Um, say, um, it's an ambiguous answer. Yeah. <laughs> and, but, but this project, project has also worked as, a, as um, you could say that this project has been put uh, for left you on, uh, uh, in pole position, and it's been really. This has been really. This has become a landmark and a showcase for Coletio, uh, you attracting new uh, new enterprises and uh, winning a, a awards for sustainability even before this project has been realized. For example, so it's. I mean, the uh, for the for the public uh, return of my invest investment, uh, it's been worked really well for them. I think. Can I ask you about um, a, a question which? I asked, I thought I'd asked it, but I have someone who's badgering me here with a phone saying, you didn't really ask the question correctly. Um, but the question, I have to interpret it. Did you do, um, when you were designing during the design process, did you do a kind of parametric uh, comparison between uh, typical concrete and this timber building? Did you do a, a comparative analysis that you could share with us? That was the no, yeah, no. Yeah. We, we didn't do that uh, on purpose. We, what we did uh, in, in the beginning, it was we set a framework where we told the client and everyone involved that we're going to do this in timber, but uh, if at some point we end up with something that we can't realize, it's very easy to switch to concrete or something else so that they had, we had their reassurance from the beginning. But then we basically refused to make a comparison with concrete because once you do that, um, you're kind of... Because this is not a project you can do in concrete. Yeah. If you wanted to make this this culture center of the concrete, it would be a whole different building. Yeah. Um, so you could say that we lied at the beginning saying that we could <laughs> exchange parts to concrete because you couldn't have. No. So since this is really adapted to being made in timber. Yeah. And you have to lie there. to your clients to convince them. <laughs> exactly. No, but no, we did not. <laughs> no, but I think in the future it will be that it would be you can make those comparisons. But yeah. right now you need you need to if you can say you could just as well do this in concrete, yeah. then you're gonna end up doing it in concrete. But for the future, I think to be able to get uh, viability and economical uh, to make this an economy, economy viable project, uh, you need to think it is as a, a timber project from the beginning. You can't do it. You can't just say that you're doing a, a concrete building which where you know everything and say that we can change it to a to a timber building. Yeah, uh, that would be that would be very costful. It's so, better to to say that we're going to do this timber building right now, and then there are, and then there are different solutions to doing that. 
but I think it's a, a bad idea to to try to put these two different systems and say that and, and, and equal say that they are equal because they're not. They're two different uh, typologies and and and and um, two different ways of of uh, doing of conducting building. Well, I mean, I that leads to my next question: is uh, how easy is it to convince clients? Do you have to convince clients? Or in, in Sweden, I presume you have an easier time than we would, let's say here, <clears throat> like say also in England, uh, you know, you would, have a, you would have some time to convince a client to say, I'm going to make your skyscraper all out of timber. And uh, of course, this is so very just looking for tips here. I know. Yeah, <laughs> no, this is a very unique project, of course. Uh, and, but it's, there's, been a, there's been a really, uh, I mean, the timber industry and the architects as well has been lobbying for this for 15 years, maybe. Uh, and it's only the recent five years that this, this change has begun. So I think we will see more and more timber uh, structures. And as, as we said before, it's about 20% of our uh, project uh, portfolio is from timber right now. Yes. So yeah, it's, it's I mean, getting, I mean, it, it is actually the, uh, uh, the investors or the developers are coming to us uh, to say that we want to build a timber building. Mm. So we get these mm. uh, questions. So oh. this well, almost uh, answers the, this question. Um, before starting a project, like before starting, for example, this project, do, do you make thermal performance analysis of different materials for the local climate? When you decide to use timber, do you compare the thermal performance of different types of materials? I guess in this project, you also started off with Timber. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, or maybe other projects uh, do you? I mean, thermal uh, comparisons at the very beginning, not really. What, what, what we do look at from the beginning is kind of the, the, the microclimatic situation and where we are and understanding that and, and making sure that our design is, is, is working um, uh, with like, um, uh, is well designed and well put up. But then when it comes to the actual thermal, um, performance of the material that comes much later, I think. Here is not so much, but it's, it's more about the structure and the carbon dioxide footprint. Um, okay, I see, hmm. I understand. Because that's, that's also important to say that when we talk about timber buildings, it's the structure that we mean. I mean, timber facades is one thing, yeah. um, that's good too, but it's, it's mainly the structure, that's where the most amount of materials are. And that's where kind of the innovation in this project. Yeah, works. that's what we are focusing on at the moment, yeah. yeah. Um, we actually talked about this before privately. Uh, has any work been done to protect the building from natural disasters? So you did talk about the fire safety of it. Maybe the question is a bit diverting to the earthquakes as well. Yeah. Um, maybe we talked but, about this, but yeah. Maybe First of all, in Sweden, we don't have to. Yeah. We don't have to think about that. I think we're the only country in the world that doesn't have. Uh, so we don't have to consider uh, earthquakes. <laughs> Uh, so, so that, that's the that's the easy answer on this question. <laughs> can I answer the Can I answer the question for? Uh, Please, yes, of course, from our point of view, yeah. From our point of view, because obviously in Turkey that we are strongly influenced yeah. by. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Go ahead. You was no, no, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. I just want to say to the Turkish listeners here, <laughs> the uh, Japan is a, an earthquake uh, zone, much worse than Turkey. And currently, a 350 meter tall uh, skyscraper in fully in timber is being planned there. Um, and actually, timber is much stronger in earthquakes than concrete. I would like anyone who wants to ask me a detailed question later, I can answer them, but not, I think this is not the subject here. But as a short answer, timber is actually much, much, much safer than. Uh, many other materials um, and it's a very surprising fact but timber basically flexes in earthquakes it does this and then it stops whereas concrete if the earthquake is too strong collapses uh, so uh, in short it's actually much safer than than many other materials to build in both from a fire point of view as well as uh, uh, earthquake but to, maybe we should wrap up slowly because I can see that Oscar got so tired. He's ran yeah, off. he ran off. <laughs> <laughs> he's had enough of these technical questions. Yeah. And you maybe. can understand uh, why there are many technical questions, Robert, because it's, it is something that 
you know, a lot of architects dream of it. They're, yeah, but they, I mean, this they, is um, one of the reasons why it's so fun working with timber projects because we can be involved in this process. Yeah. Yeah. Usually, if we do a, a, a construction uh, if it would, with the concrete, everyone, okay, we know everything about that. You can just choose color and then it's okay. Here we, ha here we have to be involved in, in all processes. And, uh, and, all, uh, and, and since, especially in this project that we're working with um, um, the uh, uh, construction timber as, uh, as the architecture or as the, the volume of the room, we need, we, we need, to, we, we need the, uh, the, the uh, supplier or the, um, for, for the material to understand that this is actually going to be the, the surface that people are going to see. So if, if the interface is between us, it's also really, we need to collaborate. We need to understand each other's languages. Yeah. No, it's a great pleasure to design in a material like that. Also, the, the, the aroma when you go into the building like that must be beautiful. Yeah. It's, yeah, yes. especially now when it's uh, like newly sawn. And, and, yeah, it uh, smells and, like a spruce yeah. forest, probably, doesn't this it? Is, like the construction site is really, feels really friendly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah. yeah. Uh, maybe we can wrap up with this nice question at the end. Uh, uh, what is your advice for small scale architecture firms to become a research based architectural practices? How can these firms start to integrate sustainable way of thinking in their practice? Oh, yeah, Without yeah, spending think, too much money. Yeah, no, but you, I think it's about, all about mindset. That you, you, you need to see the, the architecture as a, as, a, as a part of the bigger picture as part of uh, the, the, uh, the solution in, in becoming a more uh, sustainable society. And when, once you got this uh, mindset, I think you can, then you start to, to uh, look into to different investigations, which almost will lead like, to more projects, I guess, yeah. I think. Almost like personally be passionate and yeah, invest I mean, that, yeah. yourself, invest your extra time in it almost. Yeah. Well, actually the, the answer is, Partly that in Turkey it's that because the fees for architects are ridiculously low, um, because all the architects fight each other and they push each other down so that they're cutting each other's throats. But in in countries uh, like Sweden and in Germany and England, uh, al almost all practices reserve uh, some amount of time for research as part of their cost. Yeah, it's a given. You know the the the the, the amount that you mentioned actually translates to quite a large sum when you're talking about a practice your size. Yeah. You are actually saying to your clients, we are a practice that does this research, our fees are more because we do this research. Yes. And, but, take and, and, and in the end, it's also about survival for us as a company. We need to be on top of, of, uh, of the... Uh, um, the next... Yeah, I mean, in the, we need to be, we have to have the, the, the best solutions. So yeah. this is a part of us to... Uh, educate ourselves and, and, and always know, be, be forefront. So the competitiveness in your environment is about know-how, whereas the competitiveness, it tends to be in our environment here, unfortunately, is more about uh, how much money people should be spending. So we have to learn a lot from that too, I think, that, that you need time uh, yeah. to do the research and you need time to think it through and yeah. realize the project. Is, uh, we, we want to have a good end result. <laughs> Both the, both the investor and the architect <laughs> and the society. Um, yeah. I mean, it's also, it's, it's, I mean, we also do have a very kind of, uh, we, we do also compete on cost here as well. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's an integrated part, of course, of being a consultant, but um, what's actually happening and what, what people need to understand is that uh, the, the, the money that we put into research from our profits, uh, that's actually what, when we did that two years ago, that's what they get when they hire us now. We, we have that, that's the knowledge that they're paying for now, basically. And we're reinvesting that to make sure that in two or three years time, when the client comes again, well, the research that we did now is the knowledge that they pay for then. So they're not only paying us to develop knowledge all the time, they are actually accessing the knowledge that we've amassed yeah. uh, as a company as well. Yeah, it's uh, like paying it forward. One client is yeah. actually paying for yeah. the next one who's paying it forward, basically. Yeah, yeah. basically. Many it keeps yeah. going and going and going. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but it also makes works interesting. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there is a lot more to talk about, um, Oscar and Rob. Yes. I think that we will continue to talk and I'm hoping that next year you will join us uh, in a much wider 
context of the, the subject matter. We want to do this with the Swedish Institute. We've already discussed this many times. Uh, we will do um, a workshop on the use of wood, structural wood, as much as anything else, uh, to actually combine uh, our knowledge as much as possible, not just from Sweden, but we will invite people also from Norway and UK, uh, probably. And hopefully that guy who's designing the 350 meter tall uh, skyscraper let's see what he's got to say <laughs> um, but but we will cover this subject much much more than uh, than we've been able to in the last two hours and it's been wonderful I mean I've certainly enjoyed all the download of information I've got the building is amazing I really am looking forward to going to visit it hopefully uh, one day I will be able to do that um, and also um, well, White Architects is amazing. I'm really impressed. Uh, yeah. It's, a, it's a, obviously an established practice, but keeping it so uh, energized and evidently young. How old are you guys? How old are you guys? No, you shouldn't ask that. <laughs> that's not allowed. That's not polite. <laughs> we did not discuss <laughs> this. <laughs> next, next year we'll, we'll tell. <laughs> uh, but the, you know, the fact that, you know, uh, when you are very relatively young, you can put your signature on projects that are cutting edge and, you know, world uh, wide, world scale projects. I think this is something, this is something to be admired. So I would like to um, applause both White Architect, which is obviously a wonderful company and yourselves individually for being able to do this project. And uh, thank you very much for presenting it to our audience and to us. It will be online and it will be available for a long time to come. So people will be able to watch it and watch it and watch it. And they'll be able to see me in my kitchen, I think, in one of those tiny shots. <laughs> uh, but uh, thank you very much, uh, guys. We really yeah. enjoyed it. And again, should was there an audience, this is what they would be doing right now. Thank you, guys. Thank you it very was, much. Thanks thank for having us. It was a pleasure having you. Pleasure to have you. Bye. And thanks everyone for listening um, and goodbye. Yes, Bye. signing off. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.